Okay, welcome to today's City Council meeting of Tuesday, October the 5th, 2021. First order of business, looking for a motion to approve a, a bylaw to appoint Eric Nickel as our acting chief administrative assistant for tonight. Motion by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you for that. And secondly, uh, and just before I ask for the motion, reminder when we go in camera, please leave all electronic devices here in council chambers. Our Sergeant at Arms will keep an eye on things. So we're looking for a motion to go in camera, downstairs committee room two, moved by Councilor Dabrowski, seconded by Councilor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, we are now gonna move in camera. Thank you, Councilor Campbell will be chairing the in-camera meeting.
Did you get the message? Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to our council meeting tonight of Tuesday, October the 5th, 2021. And as per usual, as per our tradition, we start off with the singing of the national anthem. So tonight, our pre-recorded performance is done by Tanisha Chima. Tanisha is 10 years old. She's in grade eight at Mary Ward Catholic Elementary School. Her interests include singing, choir, and also playing soccer. Please welcome Tanisha to sing the national anthem this evening, and I invite you to stand as we listen to her sing it. Great job, Tanisha. And in case you're watching at home with mom and dad and you're online, uh, great job. We're really proud of you. You did a, I know it takes a lot of bravery to sing in front of everybody, and you did a terrific job. So thank you very, very much. Okay, moving along. With the aim of sharing information and educating our community on land treaties and acknowledging the many land treaties that overlay the city of Niagara Falls and region, I now invite Chief Stacy LaForme, Chief of the Mississaugas of the Credit, to share testimony as we acknowledge and thank the indigenous peoples who were stewards of this land for a millennia before us. We look forward, look forward to continue to build on our friendships in harmony and in shared gratitude for this special place we live in. Mr. Clerk. Me, Gima, Chief R. Stacy LaForme, Mississaugas of the Credit. I'd like to acknowledge the Creator, the world around us, and our place within it. I acknowledge the many nations that walked this land in the past, the many nations that walk it today, and welcome you to the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe. The treaties with the Mississaugas are the Niagara Treaty of 1781 and the Between the Lakes Treaty of 1792. I would also like to acknowledge the Treaty of 1764 that recognized the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which set a new relationship between the indigenous people and the Crown. Chimagwich Mumpi. Sorry. Thank you, Chief. Hearing voices from the indigenous community remains important, as this is a time for us to listen and learn. We look forward to welcoming more Indigenous friends from our community and amplifying their voices through the opportunity to share at the beginning of our council meetings as we offer a land acknowledgement and strengthen our friendships.
Okay, Mr. Chair, I'm, uh, or I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Clerk, I'm looking to add an item on the agenda. Uh, if I could uh, ask uh, council, I'd like to add a, an item pertaining to our in-camera um, meeting and uh, in regard to integrity commissioner uh, comments. How would I go about doing that? Uh, I think it would be uh, prudent uh, for the under the procedural bylaw to just uh, get a motion to introduce uh, an additional item to the agenda, and then uh, you can introduce that motion uh, after it passes. Okay. I'd ask council if we could make a motion to add an item to the agenda that I would deal with next. Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor uh, Cario. All those in favor? Okay, thank you for that. And um, I would next ask uh, Councillor Peter Angelo if you'd be willing to please chair this part of the meeting. I'm going to recuse myself and I'd like to speak on a point of personal privilege. Would you be willing to do that? Uh, absolutely, Your Worship. Okay, thank you for that. Council, I'd like to quote a recent newspaper article from the Niagara Falls Review from last Thursday, September the 23rd, 2021. And the, the quote, I'll quote, Iononi calls Diodati disgusting excuse for a mayor over use of diffusers that make her ill. Mayor insists diffusers minimize germs and purify the air. I believe this contravenes our code of conduct for council members both under section 13 of harassment and under section 15 social media. So I'd like to ask Councillor Iannone and give her the opportunity to publicly apologize to me and to the community for the disrespectful and unprofessional comments that she made. I'd like to do this in order that we could save our residents several thousands of dollars, give her the opportunity to apologize for these comments. So my motion would be that the counselor apologize publicly or the next step, and the objective is to save the taxpayers significant amount of money, or my motion is that we file a complaint with the integrity commissioner for an investigation. That is my motion, and I would look for a seconder for that motion. I'll ask if there's a seconder. Is there a seconder? Councillor Dabrowski, there's a seconder. Um, Councillor Adnoni, you've been identified. I don't know if you have any comments. I really don't have any comments. I'm not going to apologize. Um, that's my lived experience with you, Mr. Mayor. And if you don't like that, then your behavior towards me has to change. And before you talk about making things right, let me point you to an email I sent you probably 18 months ago telling you and asking you, absent a complaint that either one of us are putting forward against each other, for you and I to go to mediation because our continued dislike and animosity towards each other was not benefiting the residents, the council, or you and I. And you outrightly refused to do so. You knowingly ran those diffusers knowing it made me sick. I have three letters that I have in writing telling you that. Um, I have a letter acknowledging you telling me it wouldn't happen anymore. And then in, when the issue was raised to you, you openly said we had a choice to make and we chose to keep people safe. Well, it wasn't keeping me safe. Um, if you don't like how I explain my lived experiences with you, then I suggest you change how you treat me. And I would happily go to mediation with you again, offering so that this animosity is gone. Okay, are there any- and, and, just, and, and by the way, you don't have to cost the taxpayers money. You and Mr. Dabrowski, who just made and seconded that motion are choosing to do that. And might I remind you, the last time you sat in the mayor's chair and you spoke about our code of conduct and you spoke about the waste of money going to the integrity commissioner, Councillor Lococo stood up and said, then I think we should look at mediation before we look towards any type of investigation. And everybody agreed with that. And yet here's the second time that 
our dislike for each other and our inability to work for e with each other is you, again, asking for an integrity commissioner complaint about me. You're choosing that direction. You can choose to ask for mediation. You can choose to ask to, ask to fix the problem. I've been asking you that for 18 months. So you can stand here and make your grand gesture so you have front page on the paper tomorrow. But at the end of the day, you did not do what was best for my health. You did what you wanted. And I'm allowed to express my disgust with that. Do I have the floor, uh, Mr. Yes, Chair? Well, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm disappointed that you're not going to apologize for your disrespectful language. It goes against our code of conduct and it's absolutely unnecessary and it's unprofessional. Second thing I'll say is your, your continual uh, twisting of the facts is very frustrating because that's not at all what happened. It's mm -hmm. a con I, do I have the floor, Mr. Chair? Yes, you do. Thank you. I didn't talk while you were speaking, so I just asked that you let me speak now, Councillor. When you did originally reach out to us, we went from around 15, 16 drops per diffuser down to one drop per diffuser. And then if you'll recall, long stretch of meetings, you didn't come to City Hall. So we continued to use them to the benefit of all of us that were in attendance. And you received a response. Is, do I still have the floor, Mr. Chair? Are you, are you yes, defending, you are you talking? Excuse See, me, Councillor, you, can you got, let him finish, no, Mr. please? Mr. Chair, he's gone off on a different tangent. Councillor, can you let him finish, Councilor, can you let him are finish please? Are we arguing the efficiency, are we debating the efficiency of a diffuser? Councillor, can you let him finish? Are we debating he doesn't like my words? Can you let him finish, please? Well, of course you would, Mr. Chair, because this has nothing to do with him. He's trying to justify his own behavior. Can you let him finish, please? Sure. So you re received a response from our CAO, and I think it was very clear that there was a break in communication after that long period where you never came in person. So when you walked in, all you had to do was to point it out to us because we'd been using it for quite some time, and it would have ended. We wouldn't have left it on. And to your comments about mediation, we tried that before with our former CAO, and you absolutely did not follow through on the recommendations mediated. So I will not go down that path with you, Councillor. Either you apologize for breaking our code of conduct, for your spreading negative comments in the media and on social media, which is unnecessary, it's unprofessional. And for the record, Councillor, I don't dislike you. I dislike some of the things you do. So I would ask for that apology, and if not, then I would ask that we call the vote, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mayor, before you call a vote, I suggest you guys go back and read the report, the, Inve the uh, Integrity Commissioner report from Frank DeLuca asking me to, or in having me investigated for saying there's misogyny around that table. In that report, Mr. Maynard said that as politicians, we are open to extreme criticism and free speech. You're the mayor of this city. Mean comments are on your page all the time. My lived experience with you is exactly how I expressed it. And before you want to talk about refusing mediation, I, I disagree with Mr. Todd. I disagreed with his summary of that then. And you, you stating that you won't go down that road was from a, you decided that almost 20 months ago. The only way that you can deal with me ever is when you have the rest of the men at council standing behind you voting to go the direction you want to go. I will happily sit at a, in a room and talk about the issues with you and a mediator, but that's not how you do it. You have to have it this way because you, it's a control thing. I think on Jim Fannin, you said you don't like being told what to do. You don't like negative comments either, and we all get it as politicians. So I would read that report, which spoke about us, the negative comments we get about politicians before you vote to spend more money. And you can defer this to the next meeting and read that report. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm asking simply for an apology for disrespectful comments that contravene our code of conduct, and this will be over immediately. And if she doesn't want to, I'm okay with the integrity commissioner determining if it broke our code of conduct. So I'm giving her a chance to make this end right now. It's actually no different than last meeting when one of the counselors asked for an apology because they were cast in a, in a light that they didn't like. So I would just mention that. 
Yeah, I think she was cast in a light that was untrue. Okay. All right. Are there any other comments then before I call the vote? Councilor Carrier. Thank you, Worship. Uh, you're acting, Worship. Um, I don't disagree with uh, a lot of the comments that were made. It's just that it doesn't matter whether you like someone or don't like someone. When we have to work together, we've all signed a code of conduct that we would treat each other with a certain amount of respect. You can disagree. You can not like someone. I could care less. But the comments that I read in the paper, I think, go above and beyond dislike or not getting along. And at some point, you have to draw a line at what you think can come out of your mouth. I don't mind in this time having a, having a commissioner, uh, integrity commissioner, have a look at this, because I think that'll definitely decide what can be said and what can't be said. You obviously don't have to like someone, you can be critical of them, but those comments are wrong, are not acceptable, and I'll support the motion. And I'd support the motion if I was a man, if I was a woman, if I was a monkey, I'd be supporting the motion. Mr. Chair, can I just clarify something? The mayor just said that if I had let them know that continuing to, to run the mist was making me sick, just so that you're clear, the week before I, had, I got so sick and went home, the meeting before, I did. The mist upstairs was running. I had asked our staff to turn it off because it made me sick. When we went downstairs, the mist was running again, and I unplugged it myself and said it made me sick. So when he says it, it, it's been a long time, that's, that's incorrect. And actually, I think I emailed all of you and highlighted that. And the very last meeting of Mr. Todd with us in that room, I had to ask a counselor to ask Mr. Todd to shut off the mist. And that was maybe six months ago. So to say that I haven't let him know, let the city know since I wrote the mayor a letter is absolutely wrong. So if you want to put information forward, I might have a problem with that, but don't put information forward that's not accurate. That was the second meeting in a row that that mist was running to the point where it made me sick, except I took the matters into my own hands the first time. Unfortunately, I was too sick the second time. Okay. I, oh, sorry, Councilor Stern. Mr. I just I walked in just about ten minutes ago. What is the motion actually on the floor right now? I'll ask the clerk to read the motion. Uh, the motion by uh, Mayor Diodati and seconded by Councilor Dabrowski was that uh, Councilor Iannone offer an apology for the comments made uh, that violated the. Uh, two sections of the Code of Conduct, Section 13.1 and Section 15, uh, regarding social media. And if an apology was not granted, that uh, Council uh, file a Code of Conduct violation with the Integrity Commissioner. Sorry, and what, what were the comments? The exact comments? Well, I can... Uh in the paper, in Niagara Falls Review, Thursday, September 23rd, Iannone calls Diodati disgusting excuse for a mayor over use of diffusers at Maker Hill. Mayor insists diffusers minimize germs and purify the, the air. So the comments, disgusting excuse for a mayor uh, done publicly. So all Councillor Iannone has to do is apologize and this goes away and doesn't go to integrity commissioner and cost the taxpayers money? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I have Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My first thought was to suggest mediation, but the mayor has already said that he wouldn't go for mediation because it didn't work prior. I guess my second comment would be when we were discussing the code of conduct changes, we changed it to that council could submit a complaint. I voted against that. I feel that if there's an issue between two people, then those two people should deal with it. So if the mayor feels that uh, Councillor Iannone has contravened the code, I feel that the mayor should file a complaint, not the council. So I will not vote for it. Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Your Acting Worship. <clears throat> Ironically, it wasn't until I read the article in the review that I was aware of the, of the problem. I, that's the first I, I had heard about it. Um, and 
I was offended by some of the comments. I'm offended by the comments where she says I'm part of the old boys club, that I'm a misogynist. And that is far, far, far from the truth. When I was acting vice principal at Stanford High School, I, wow. I never, never treated a kid as being bad, but rather making poor choices. You provided a choice for Counselor Iannone to make. If she makes a poor choice tonight, the consequences are going to be a, a, a commission. So it's up to her to make the choice. And I hope she makes a good choice. Okay, if there aren't any other comments then, everyone understands the motion, I'll call the vote. Excuse me, just yep. sorry. Councilor Strange. Sure. Didn't we have a same kind of situation last meeting where one yes. councilor apologized to the other councilor because... Yeah, I, I already mentioned that. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, because they were cast in a, in a light that they didn't like. Yeah. Okay. If there aren't any other comments, then I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll pass the chair back to you. Thank you very much. Okay, moving along to the adoption of the minutes from our council meeting of September the 14th, 2021. And um, now we've got it listed twice here, Mr. Clerk. Is it yours too? Uh, yeah, it's just the one second. Okay. So uh, looking for an adoption of the minutes from our council meeting of September the 14th, 2021. Moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. Um, disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Councilor LaCoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, 7.4 MW 2021-68 road closure for downtown BIA, the winter market. Uh, my husband's former employee and I have emailed the clerk. Thank you for that. Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks your worship. Uh, PBD 2021-53 dealing with the future strategic growth direction. Uh, my family owns land that's been identified in Schedule 1 of the report. And the same conflict for PDS 36-2021. It's a correspondence from the region that deals with the settlement area boundary review. The same conflict. Uh, as well, CD 2021-05, dealing with a fee waiver from St. Paul High School. NCDSB is my employer. And also, there's an, interdepartment, an interdepartmental memo from the city clerk dealing with the school board professional development day request. Uh, and there's a resolution for that also in the NCDSB as my employer. I'll give this to the clerk. Hey, thank you for that. Councilor Inoni, do you have a conflict? No. Oh, your, your hand's up on your screen. Oh, I didn't touch it. Hmm. Okay, if there's no further disclosures, uh, we'll move on to everyone's favorite part of the meeting. Uh, we'll start off first with obituaries, uh, condolences, condolences, uh, can we mute that? Thank you. Um, condolences go out to Councillor Thompson on the loss of his brother Chuck Thompson, a longtime City of Niagara Falls firefighter, and uh, we know that it was difficult for you, Councillors, so uh, condolences on behalf of the City. Council and senior staff birthdays, I know upcoming uh, we'll miss this one. Is Councillor Peter Angelo's birthday on Sunday, October the 24th? 32nd. Yeah, the 32nd. Uh, council rep representation. I'd like to thank Councillor Lococo for representing the city at the Niagara Falls Art Competition and the Monarch Ultra Run for Pollinator Protection. Councillor Campbell for representing the city at the 2021 United Nations International Day of Peace. And to Councillors Strange and Peter Angelo, representing the city and, and coming along and bringing me along with you to the Trillium Award Deliveries. So that was a lot of fun. We had a lot of deliveries. We made it just before the sun went down. We got to see a lot of hydrangeas and roses and all sorts of all different plants. Uh, 2022 budget engagement. Residents can visit the budget engagement hub on the Let's Talk page. You go to letstalk.niagarafalls.ca. You can learn about how the budget works and how it impacts you. 
The new recreation, culture, and parks master plan is being put together. The plan will guide the city for the next 10 years. Overview of the outdoor recreation facilities, arts and culture, parks, and open spaces are going to be part of the process. And again, I invite you to visit Let's Talk dot niagarafalls.ca to give your input and find out what we're up to and what we're planning. I was just recently at the uh, season opener of the Junior B Canucks. I was able to drop the puck on Friday the 24th of September. That was great. It's so nice to see a lively crowd back in the Gale Center and uh, it seemed that the players were all really excited to be skating once again. Heaters Heroes. I want to thank Councillor Mike Strange and uh, what a great event. This was the 10th and a half anniversary. I don't think I've ever been part of a 10th and a half anniversary, but 10.5 went very, very well. Uh, Counselor Strange, again, for childhood cancer and having all these kids, and this is something I'm told they look forward to all year to do a lap with different local celebrities. And uh, it was also joined by Counselor Peter Angelo and Counselor Thompson. And, pardon me? Dabrowski. And Counselor Dabrowski. I'm sorry about, I'm sorry about that. I didn't get all the information. Thank you, and Councillor Dabrowski. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge 100th birthday for Evelyn Gavin. I was also joined by Councillor Thompson. Real neat story. He, pardon me? <clears throat> Whose birthday? His oh, his 100th. <laughs> He's not there yet. Um, so it was a neat story. He presented her her 90th and they both joked that they'd be back for her 100th. And indeed, we were there for her 100th. And uh, boy, was she ever, you, you would have never known, they had to point out who was having their 100th birthday because I truly wouldn't have known. She looked terrific, really sharp too. CN, Canadian National, had their Eco Connections tree planting. 139 trees were planted along the Millennium Trail, along the Lions Legacy Trail. I was joined by Councillor Dabrowski. Truth and Reconciliation Day took place Thursday, September the 20th. We had a moment of silence at 9.15. We had a flag raising. Every Child Matters flag, flag was raised and then lowered of all the flags. Orange shirts and the falls illuminated in orange also took place that evening. And uh, we had great learning opportunities. It was a, a time to listen. And I was joined by, I know, Councillor Dabrowski, Councillor Lococo, and um, I think that was it, I believe. I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm not right, but thank you for everyone for being there. And a lot of staff came. We had some indigenous leaders there sharing their stories, and uh, it was a nice uh, ceremony, and I thanks to staff for all the work they did putting the event together. Thank you. We had some grand openings. Cheryl's Subs on Victoria Avenue, the new Giant Tiger out at the old Niagara Square. We had Ride Skate Shop, which is a skateboard shop on Main Street. Uh, really excited. Uh, it's the only skateboard town uh, store in town. Charlie's Bridal on Queen Street, which is the only wedding gown shop that we have in Niagara Falls. And my gosh, beautiful gowns, whether you're the bride or, or maybe the mother of the bride or whoever, they've got some really, really neat outfits. They had a, somebody playing a harp, which was really... And lastly... Uh, I'd like to uh, mention that our CAO, Jason Burgess, uh, as you heard, we have our uh, acting CAO tonight, Eric Nickel. Uh, as you may have heard, our CAO was riding his bicycle in St. Catharines and was in an accident with a vehicle. Uh, he's doing well. He's recuperating. He's having some issues that he's dealing with. We wish him well in his recovery. Appreciate that during his time of recovery, he was going to be with us virtually, but he did have a bit of a setback. So our thoughts are with him as he works on a full recovery. I'd like to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving in advance and remind everyone that the next council meeting will be Tuesday, October the 26th, right here. Same bat time, same bat channel. So moving along, let me get my iPad up and running again. So we're now moving on to the planning portion of the agenda. And I would ask our city clerk if he would mind introducing the next item on the agenda. A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's official plan and zoning bylaw to permit a five-story apartment building with 39 units at 2788 through to 2798 
St. Paul Avenue. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Friday, September 3rd, 2021, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I now ask our Director of Planning, Mr. Hurlovich, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed amendments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, this, <clears throat> excuse me, this application involves a parcel of land on uh, St. Paul Avenue, and the request is to permit a five-story apartment building. The property is uh, located uh, north of Church's Lane on the east side of St. Paul, uh, across the street from an apartment building. We have Queen's Coach Restaurant, Commercial Plaza. There's some industrial uses uh, adjacent to the property. And then um, the majority of the lands in the surrounding area are detached dwellings. The proposal is for a five-story apartment building containing 39 dwelling units. The property itself, or the application itself, is for an official plan amendment to permit a density of 150 units per hectare. The application also intends to amend the zoning bylaw. The property is currently zoned light industrial, and the applicant wishes to have, have a residential apartment 5E zone. The R5E zone would have special or site-specific regulations regarding minimum front yard depth, minimum landscape open space, parking regulations, and maximum lot coverage. The uh, office had an open house virtually in July of this year. Uh, two residents were in attendance. Since that time, we received a number of com written comments in the office, uh, three residents in favor of the development, five residents not in favor of the development. Those in favor believe that the proposed height is not an issue, that it will the condominium will complement building across the street, that it will appeal to young working professionals, it will enhance the street, as a good use of empty land, the owner has cleaned up the site, it will add to the tax base. Those opposed to the uh, proposal had concerns about drainage, loss of privacy, quality of life, they're concerned about the proposed height not being consistent with buildings in the area, tree removal, disruption of wildlife habitat, the location of the parking lot, the elevational change of the land uh, on St. Paul Avenue as it uh, moves east towards um, residential development and the current condition that is the traffic uh, on St. Paul Avenue. The applicant's uh, planner did speak to this. He uh, explained that the minimum overlook and the shadow impact of the building will um, be reduced because the nearest dwellings are further away than the height of the building itself. The applicant also has uh, provided a tree saving plan to protect trees along the property boundary. The landscape plan will be reviewed to ensure that there are proper plantings and a fence and that the stormwater management plan will demonstrate that stormwater from the site will be directed towards St. Paul Avenue sewers. The uh, planning department looked at the provincial policy statements and found that the proposed development is consistent and conforms with the, the uh, provincial policy statement and the provincial place to grow. It will add to the diversity of housing options. It is transit supportive, will assist the city in meeting its intensification target in the built up area and an environmental site assessment has been completed, which indicates there are no soil contamination based on past commercial uses. This will be subject to filing a record of site condition with the Ministry of Environment. The official plan designates the lands as residential. There is a special policy on this area, which provides that the area is in transition, and that land uses will move from industrial to residential. The proposal complies with the intent of the official plan. The site is suitable for intensification as it abuts an arterial road where apartment buildings up to six stories are encouraged. Additional density of up to 150 units per hectare can be supported due to the proximity to commercial uses and transit. 
the municipal services are available and the transportation network can support the traffic generated. The scale and massing of the proposed building and its setbacks respects the surrounding um, built form. The building is separated by a distance significantly greater than the building height from the nearest residential dwellings. And in addition, there are vacant lands between the subject lands and existing dwellings, which are expected to be developed in the future for compatible low rise dwellings to provide additional transition uh, from the existing development. The side yard setbacks of the abutting commercial uh, land uses are appropriate and the landscaping and fencing will be used to mitigate any conflicts between the land uses. The majority of the parking is to be provided below grade in a parking structure. The proposed five-story apartment building is within the permitted height limits of the official plan. The proposed development will provide residential, or residents rather, a greater choice of housing, and the city's housing needs supply report identified a need to provide more mid-rise apartment buildings to diversify the city's housing supply. The um, zoning requested is uh, a change from light industrial to the residential 5E zone. They're also looking for uh, site-specific provisions. So we're seeking a front yard depth of 5.6 meters plus 13 meters from the center line of St. Paul. They're looking for a maximum lot coverage of 39%. Normally the R5E zone would have a 30% lot coverage and they're looking for a uh, parking in the front yard where a decorative wall would be required. The park, there's one parking space that's within this front yard area where the arrow is pointed. As well, the, uh, they're looking for a minimum uh, landscaped open space area of 33%. And they're looking for a um, projection of balconies of 1.8 meters into the uh, the side yard uh, on the south side only. And then the parking uh, spaces, they're looking for a parking ratio of 1.25 spaces per unit instead of 1.4 spaces per unit. That's a difference of five parking spaces. The property, as I said, is currently zoned light industrial. The official plan anticipates that industrial uses will transition to residential uses. The proposed R5E zone will permit an apartment building. The reduction in the minimum front yard depth can be supported as it, uh, there's adequate landscaping to provide a buffer next to the street. And the uh, it, this setback is suitable to provide the street for minimum shadowing. The L-shaped configuration of the building also lessens the visual domination of the development on the streetscape. The building is being limited to five stories that's a larger footprint is proposed. Uh, that's a 9% increase in the maximum lot coverage, which is considered minor. There is no impact on the abutting properties as the interior uh, side yard and rear yard setbacks meet or exceed the existing zone requirements of the R5E zone. Proposed parking is within 10% of the zone requirement and is supported by the transportation services staff and it's also noted that there is a transit stop 200 meters south of the uh, property, which will facilitate alternative means of transportation. The reduction of minimum landscape open space can be supported as there is a suitable amount of landscaping around the building and uh, parking to buffer the adjacent properties. And in addition, a portion of the roof is proposed to have a green outdoor amenity area. The increase in the projection of balconies and the required south side yard can be supported as it will not create any impacts on that property and will provide private outdoor amenity space for residents. The uh, staff are recommending that the site specific zone be limited to a five story building and a height of 16.5 meters as measured from the front elevation. We're also recommending that the bylaw include a holding regulation to secure the filing of a record of site condition with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks and to the satisfaction of the region. So staff have found that the proposed development does conform with provincial policies. It conforms with the official uh, plan uh, designation for residential use, excuse me. And the requested R5E zone permits dwelling units 
uh, and the regulations would be appropriate for the form of development. Therefore, staff are recommending that Council approve the official plan and zoning bylaw amendments as detailed in the report to permit a density of 150 units per hectare, rezone the property residential uh, apartment 5E zone with site specific regulations, <coughs> which would allow the 39 units, and that a holding zone, uh, sorry, a holding provision be included to require a record of site condition. Those are the highlights of the re uh, report. Thank you, Mr. Hurlovich. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Hurlovich? Councilor Dabrowski? Yeah, through you to uh, Mr. Hurlovich. Were there any traffic concerns? I'm just thinking about that area. I think the proposal is great. It uh, definitely complements in terms of the building across the street, but I know St. Paul Avenue being single uh, traffic in and out, um, and with Ryle Street, that, that intersection is a bit of a, could be a bit of a gong show. I'm just wondering if, if there are any traffic concerns. I know there's a condo development that's going up beside Eagle Valley. It just seems to be a lot of um, people moving into that area. It's an established area, but just, just throwing that question out there, I didn't see anything in the report. I might have missed it. Mr. Hurlovich? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. To the councillor, the uh, Transportation Services Department uh, is satisfied that the, um, the uh, design and capacity of St. Paul Avenue can take the additional uh, traffic movements from the 39 units. Okay, fair enough. Once you close the meeting, I'm happy to make a motion. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Okay, if there's no questions of council. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed amendments. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone that wishes to speak to the amendments? Uh, yes, Your Worship, we do have two members of the public that had registered with the clerk's office. Uh, the first one being uh, Mr. David Opie, and I, I'm told that uh, both himself and the next speaker are online, and I just ask Your Worship if you could ask that they, uh, for the purpose of the record, if they could state their name and address. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Opie, are you there? I am, sir. Okay, great. So if you could state your, well, we know your name, if you could state your address, and we ask you to keep your comments to five minutes if you could. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm at 6189 Harbor Street. That is immediately behind the proposal. Um, and I respectfully disagree with uh, most of the items that uh, uh, Mr. Herlovich uh, mentioned. And I find it interesting also that the traffic was just raised with another counselor there. Um, I spent uh, 10 years at Regional Niagara Traffic Department, and I can see that street being uh, pretty soon a nightmare as the growth of Niagara on the Lake, and that's the main corridor going through. Um, there's considerations probably as, as, as developments uh, go up that you may want to look for uh, bike lanes put on there. Uh, which would be a bit of an issue, or a center turn lane, which might be advised. Um, and this all goes back to the building setback, which is um, not what it should be according to your regular regulations. Um, also find it that this particular project has uh, seven variances that, that are required, um, which seems to me to be pretty high. And I, I, I really don't see a five-story building fitting in, even though it says it does. It's not a significant departure from the surrounding properties. Well, it sure is. Um, uh, the proposed six-story and 10-story units at McLeod, sorry, Mountain Road, Mountain Road in St. Paul, uh, I did enclose some pictures with my uh, comments uh, that I took from that area and that whole built up area is nothing compared to the residential and light industrial units that we have in the area of the proposed building. Um, I fully realize that 
trying to get that building to three stories or four stories would probably make it non-profitable for the builder. I could personally live with three stories. I don't think that would be an issue. Four, maybe even so, but five, since it's also measured from the height of St. Paul Avenue and my yard is approximately 10 feet or uh, three meters lower than St. Paul Avenue. So the building in essence to me is a lot higher than it is to somebody on St. Paul Avenue. Um, I did not do a 45 degree uh, drawing to scale because I didn't have enough dimensions that were real. Um, I, I think the, the proposal also to allow the uh, um, patios or whatever, whatever you call uh, being set out from the building um, is going to be a bit of an issue on several sides. That would be uh, towards the car repair um, location. I'm getting my east and west mixed up, so I don't want to say what they are. And uh, also, uh, there's uh, a towing company that is renting a Quonset hut uh, right next door. And the indications in the paperwork were that uh, there's nothing going on in that building immediately north, uh, just a, a rental office. Well, that's wrong. It is really a uh, specialty uh, automotive uh, building facility, um, which builds um, specialty motors and race cars. I don't think that's gonna go over too well with the neighbors on their balcony, nor will the uh, towing rig, which is a huge rig, starting up at three in the morning with a diesel engine. Um, so I think there's more to the story than, than the reports indicate in, in all sections of the uh, seven items of whatever it is I'm looking for here, variances um, to, to be thrown in there like that. Um, I fully realize I watched the uh, maximum height of buildings in Niagara Falls, uh, particularly looking over the falls, go from 10 floors to 15 to 20 to 26 to 33 to 50 or whatever is that. And it just kept uh, changing, changing the bylaws and, and the buildings went up anyway. So that's probably a sign of progress. But we're talking about uh, an area here of specific single family dwellings with the exception of the nice three story condo across the street, um, which seems to flow in pretty well. Um, it's, just, it's just inappropriately high. It's gonna be as high as the trees um, also, one of their recommendations uh, was that they're going to, or not recommendations, proposals, they're, they're leaving up some uh, trees here as a bit of a barrier, but they're also taking down, I believe, 47 uh, trees. Um, so the, the green part of the whole story is a bit of a fabrication. Um, my concern specifically with our family and, and home here is that uh, our backyard is where we pretty much live. And uh, they're gonna be looking at us from five floors of uh, projected balconies. It looks like there's uh, two on each floor facing my way. Um, and I did request that uh, the builder put some trees up along the, I kind of say it's a walkway that goes along the entire project. I'm sorry I don't have any pictures here I can show you. Um, the part of the entrance road that they're, they're using for servicing that proposed building, uh, that continues down to be a, um, a, a walkway on the drawings that I have from 1950 anyways. Um, and I propose that uh, the builder stick up some 15 and 20 foot uh, evergreens on that or on our property right next to that because anything planted by the building, it just won't be high enough uh, in my lifetime. So that's my concerns. Uh, I appreciate the time. Um, let's see what you can do with them as you discuss them. And thank you very much. I'm out of here. Thanks very much, Mr. Opie. Uh, Mr. Hurlovich, regarding the um, concerns about privacy and having uh, more mature trees, 
can the neighbors be a part of the site plan process where they can, that you can make sure that we've got that kind of separation with some vegetation? Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes. Uh, if council wishes to add that to the recommendations and the motions, we can include Mr. Opie and perhaps even the next speaker who we have yet to hear from. Okay, that's great. Thanks for that. Um, we'll go on to our next uh, speaker. Ms. Morissette, are you there? Yep. I don't yes, good yeah. evening. Oh, Can good you hear e me? Yes, we, we hear you. Oh, okay. so, this is great. Sorry, I had to if um, you could just evening. introduce, I'm sorry. Sure. If you could just uh, give us your address, if you would, and then uh, you'll have five minutes to express your views, if you can, and uh, we'll try to get you some answers if you have any questions. Thank you, Mayor. My name's Roseanne Morissette, and I'm a resident of Stamford Village Condos at 2799 St. Paul Avenue. Okay, great. My concern with the development is the ingress and egress of vehicles. Uh, we had a tragic fatality in the summer, and I just, with, I just don't know, I can't envision how the cars will come in and out of the, uh, of the development, um, and it's directly across from our development. And St. Paul is a very, very busy um, road. And uh, I, you know, so the, the concern is that we don't have any more uh, traffic fatalities. I also agree with Mr. Opie that aesthetically, um, five, a five-story building isn't going to look very pleasing opposite our three-story Stamford Village condo. And that St. Paul Avenue is right now a very strange mix of commercial and residential. Um, I'm sure it's, it would be more attractive to have the uh, apartment building than another commercial development there. But um, I guess mainly my concern is the ingress and egress um, overall. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Hurlovich, did you want to weigh in on the ingress and the egress situation? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, really don't have anything to add beyond what I've already mentioned and that is uh, that our traffic people have looked at the property and have identified that there is capacity on on the road uh, having been a former resident of royal street i am familiar with the area and certainly that intersection I realize miss morissette is speaking about an area slightly north of there um, but um, i you know i i'm going to uh, assume that our transportation people are satisfied. They did, did review the, uh, the project and pro, um, pro, pronounced it as uh, being satisfactory. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Mr. Hlevich. Um Ms. Morissette, did you have interest in being part of the site planning uh, part of this development where you would have a voice with regard to some of the amenities that are gonna take place on site? Yes, thank you, Mayor, I would welcome that. Okay, that's great. All right, do we have any other um, speakers, Mr. Clerk? Okay, so that is it for speakers. So council will now hear from anyone, I'm sorry, where'd we go here? Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Hi, good evening. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeremy Train. I'm a planner with MPJ Planning Solution, and we are the agent for this official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment application. Uh, first, we want to thank Mr. Hurlovich for his presentation, and we want to express our agreement with staff recommendation for the approval of the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment application. We do have a presentation prepared to uh, provide council with more information related to the proposed development, as well as our approach to the building height and massing um, for the future development, um, which I will go over shortly. And my colleague and I will be available to answer any questions from council at the end of the presentation. Yeah, Mr. Chen, I'd suggest focus just on anything that we don't already know. Our director yes. of planning did a very thorough job. So if there's anything other than what he's done, I'd suggest just focus on that if there is anything that he didn't cover. For sure. 
Um, I just wonder, um, would I be able to share my screen with everybody? Yes, you can. Right. Hi, um, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. Um, so I'm just gonna skip over this part because Mr. Holovich has talked about them before. One thing that we, I wanna point out is the total number of um, amendments, zoning amendments that we're asking for is only five, not seven. Um, Similarly to what has been identified in staff uh, report on page five, we're only asking for five items um, to be amended from the current zoning bylaw. And um, in terms of when determining our building height and massing, because uh, we have heard that it is a concern from the residents in the nearby area. So when determining our buildings uh, height and massing which have turned to the Niagara region urban design guidelines to to provide guidance and we have designed our buildings to fit within a 45 degree angle plane taken from the adjacent properties including the um, residential properties on Harvey Street so this is just one of the examples that we have done for um, the surrounding residential development so this one is a 45 degree angle of plane analysis for the property at 6179 Harvey Street. And the cross section that we're looking at here is follow the line of the black lines here. So on the left hand side, we have the proposed development um, and a subject plan. And the proposed development is five story and 16.5 meter high. And in the middle, we have this vacant lands here. And all of the trees in this vacant land would be retained. We're not proposing to remove any of them. And on the right hand side, we would have 6179 Harvey Street. And as you can see, the proposed development fit completely within this 45 degree angle of planes, indicating that there would be very minimal visual impact um, from the proposed development. And we did the same analysis for several um, residential properties on Harvey Street as well as St. Paul Avenue. And we arrived at the same conclusions that the proposed development fit within the 45 degree angle of planes. And um, therefore the, the building's height and massing is appropriate and would not cause major adverse visual impact on the surrounding properties. Um, and again, just in our conclusion, we um, echo a lot of what Mr. Hrolovich has said, and the proposed development will facilitate a higher density residential development that optimizes the valuable land resources within the built up areas and maintaining a positive public private interface on St. Paul and a compatible built form with the surrounding uses. Um, thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have any questions for Mr. Tran? Council, okay. Um, are we able to move forward, Mr. Clerk, or is there anyone else that needs to uh, speak? That's it. Okay, great. The public meeting with respect to the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. What is the wish of council? Oh, uh, Councilor Dabrowski, you wanted to uh, move this one? Okay, we've got two recommendations. So mo moved by Councillor Dabrowski. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Strange? Yeah. And with that friendly amendment that we have the um, residents, that surrounding residents uh, with the records of site plan. Okay, with Ms. Dropey and Ms. Morissette to be part of the yeah. site plan process. Are you okay with that to the mover? Okay, that's the motion moved by Councillor Dabrowski, second by Councillor Strange. Any discussion to the motion? Councillor Lococo? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In any development, I think the residents always have concerns about parking, trees, water, and traffic. Uh, I think our staff and the developer have addressed um, most of those. The parking, we're reducing the parking, and I'm always concerned about parking because the less parking we have, then cars move to other places. I know in the report it did talk about uh, bicycles, uh, but realistically, I can't see somebody driving their bike 
five days a week going to an office. Uh, most people would have a car. Um, so I'm always concerned about parking. We are reducing it, but it seems to be within the parameters of what's acceptable. Um, I will support the motion. Those are the things that we always seem to um, be concerned about, and I hope the residents are satisfied and being part of the site plan process. Okay, thank, thank you. you for that. Any other questions or comments to the motion? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. So thank you, Mr. Tran, and thank you, Mr. Opie and Ms. Morissette for being on the call. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, we are moving along to reports. Um, item 7.1 is the CAO vaccine policy update. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Dabrowski to uh, move the recommendation and approve it. Uh, is that to speak to it, Councillor? Yes. Councillor Campbell. Um, I do support the motion. However, what is City Hall's uh, rules and regulations with respect to unvaccinated people coming into the building? Um, maybe who would address? I guess Mr. Uh, Nickel. Mr. Nickel, would you be the one to address? Is that who it would be, Mr. Clerk? Okay. Or Mr. Dark. Yep. So I'll leave Mr. Nickel's on the screen. We'll go to you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And to the Councilor's question, um, the city uh, is right now, um, as you've seen in some of the media releases and the notices we've published, um, we're open and following the uh, vaccine passport um, uh, procedure. So you must uh, show your proof of vaccination to enter. And we have been discussing at our EOC uh, what that means for alternative service for those who aren't eligible um, by having not uh, uh, been vaccinated. Um, I, uh, I would prefer at this point to ask um, another one, or another member from our team to maybe jump in to see if there's more to share. That's my uh, limited knowledge of what we're doing right now. Um, and that might be Mr. Dark, excuse me, Mr. Dark or um, our fire chief, um, Sam Beto. Yeah, so would uh, either of you, uh, Chief Sam Beto or Mr. Dark wanna add to that? Okay, you're both on the screen, so you guys can uh, argue over who gets to speak or who wants to speak. Good, e good evening, Mr. Chair. I could elaborate briefly. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Um, we've been discussing this at our EOC, and um, what we, uh, through our security guard that will be at the entrance of uh, City Hall, for those, uh, as our uh, acting CEO uh, mentioned, uh, will will be showing a proof of vaccination. But for those who are not uh, vaccinated, um, there is a, uh, a caveat within the regulation that if you uh, will only be doing business that will take less than 15 minutes, um, uh, for example, paying a bill or picking up a document, if you will, um, those who are not vaccinated, vaccinated will be told to uh, make an appointment uh, with a specific staff person or department and uh, depending on what their uh, requirements are or their needs are uh, either a special arrangement could be made uh, with that staff person either to drop off payment uh, at a counter or uh, or exchange a parcel if you will um, but uh, as long as that uh, that need for that particular individual does not exceed uh, 15 minutes a scheduled appointment uh, will be will be made uh, to ensure that uh, there is no interaction with any other member of the public uh, within the city, our, our city, any city facility, uh, or um, any member of our employee. Councillor Campbell, will uh, masks be required? Again, through you, uh, uh, your worship. Yes, uh, masks will always be required within any. Uh, facility, municipal facility, where you cannot uh, physical distance greater than two meters. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a question. So, being immunocompromised, I've made it my own personal choice not to be anywhere near people who I knowingly know are not double vaxxed. 
not can't come in my house my family members aren't communicating with or or i would say socializing with people who are not double vaxxed either um if we're coming into in camera can we be assured that we're in an in camera chamber um, downstairs or upstairs with people who are all double vaxxed i don't know how I, i'm trying to task it delicately but are we assured that when we're in the meetings that we're with people who are double vaxxed and or they have masks on in our social distancing uh, the mayor just had to step out so um i guess i would probably refer this over to chief sambito again I think all of council is already declared. Uh, I'm just not sure about staff, Councillor Inoni. Yeah, and I and I so and I don't want to publicly ask who is who isn't, but our report says, if I'm not mistaken, that 39% are not. 61% are 39 are not. Is yeah. that am I? So I. No, you're right. I'm, I mean, it it also gives a breakdown um, by departments there. So yes, um, so so I I don't want to personally point people out i just want to be assured that when we go in that room downstairs because i mean at one point there was 17 people in a room with us and with all of us together and i just want to make sure that we that the, those rules are for also our employees who are not double vaxxed sure i'll see if uh, i have to pass this over to either mr nickel or mr zambito yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I, if I may uh, begin, uh, and uh, through you to the councillor, um, the intent of this policy is to provide that level of protection. So what I mean by that is to either have the staff person be fully vaccinated or to be tested in such a frequency that there's a higher guarantee that they're going to be protected um, from COVID. So when that time, uh, when that uh, policy comes into effect after November 15th, I think the councillor can have the guarantee that our staff are protecting uh, one another. Um, we have a period of time between now and November 15th uh, for those staff who elected not to get vaccinated or not to disclose to go and get vaccinated. Uh, and that is our a strong encouragement. So um, between now and November 15th, uh, to the councillor's point, that's not something we can provide to council directly um, however, we uh, would continue to operate in all of our, our facilities with um, daily screening. So in order to enter, you must screen uh, and anyone showing symptoms must um, um, be turned away from those facilities, staff included. Uh, so to, to the councillor's point, I, I don't believe it's our intention to disclose to anyone at this point in time, whether it's council or other staff members who's fully vaccinated. Um, but those are the terms of the policy that are and the timeframes that would give those reassurances. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Nickel, and thank you for that explanation. I don't, I'm not asking you to ever tell us who is not. That's, uh, that's none of our business. I just want to make sure that before people come into a meeting where we close a door and there's many of us in there, that cities, I'm, I'm sure you're aware who, it, who is not double vaxxed or, or HR or whoever like, I, I don't know how you're doing it, but I just want to make sure that there is a governing person body, just making sure if we're going into a meeting with that many people, that the person who is not double vaxxed um, is, is social distancing and wearing a mask. I, it, it just, it's just paranoid, um, anxiety driven need I have just to know that. I don't want to know who it is. I just want to know that you're making sure that everybody in that meeting room is safe. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Any, yes, Councillor Campbell. Just to take it to the next level, Your Worship, um, we have a lot of committees with a lot of members on it. Um, if we're having a meeting in one of our facilities, members of that co committee will not be allowed into the meeting if i understand it correctly if they haven't been double vaxxed so can i get some clarification from the chief just to make sure uh, and or trent that uh, that's the fact or if not help us understand if i may through you your worship 
uh, to the councillor. Um, the intent is also to include any committee, any members of the public entering to any facility that you will either be fully vaccinated, show proof of fully vaccination, or you must provide a valid rapid test prior to entering if you are to remain in any facility greater than 15 minutes. I hope I uh, answered your question. Does that answer your question, Councilor? Uh, <laughs> I guess what is meetings say? usually last longer than 15 minutes. Yes, they do. Yeah. Through you, Your Worship, yes, they do. <laughs> so they will have to provide proof of vaccination or a valid rapid test. Okay. Okay. Yes, they Councilor. can only stay for 15 minutes. Uh, Chief, did you catch that? Sorry, I did not. Could you please repeat? But they can only stay for 15 minutes. Again, through you, Your Worship, no, if, if most meetings do last uh, longer than 15 minutes. So if they are coming to a committee meeting, uh, they will uh, either have to show proof of vaccination or a rapid test that as a result of them not being vaccinated so they could participate in the meeting. But I will also add that in most of our committee meetings or most of our facilities, uh, our IS department has done a, a great job in ensuring that any member of the public, counselor or staff person uh, can attend a meeting virtually if uh, they feel uh, uncomfortable or uh, as a result of an illness or, or whatever, the, uh, the, the, what, whatever the reason is, uh, we're trying to ensure that we can accommodate most of our meeting uh, rooms throughout the city especially uh, in City Hall. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you for that. I've got Councillor Cario and then Lacoco. Well, Your Worship, a lot of people seem to want to hang their, their hats on people having double vaccinations. I'm more concerned about people taking the screening process more seriously and masking. Because whether you're double vaccinated or not vaccinated, um, you, could, you could carry, you can still carry the virus and pass it on to others. That's a well-known fact. So I think that we need to take the screening process uh, really seriously. I know I, you know, you read through the thing, and but I know that there's people who have a lot of kids go to school today. The kids go and they're maybe um, uh, bump up against uh, someone in school that's got the sniffles. They come home, now that person's exposed. They come here. We don't know that. Uh, to me, that's a lot more important than worried about if I'm in a room with someone that's got two vaccinations. I'm worried about people that take screening very seriously, coming in contact with someone who appears to have a symptom or they have been near someone that has a symptom. Uh, to me, that's more important. So I, I'd just like to make sure that our staff is really diligent on the screening and the masking, which I think gives people as much, if not more protection than worried about if they've got two vaccinations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If our staff have to be tested twice a week if they're not vaccinated, if we have a person coming into City Hall or coming to a committee meeting, say the meeting is on Thursday, what is the valid testing? How many days before do you have to get it? Or if you got it on Monday, is it okay for a Thursday visit? Does it have to be two days? Like what, what is the process? I think it's 72 hours, but I'll ask the chief uh, if you could weigh in on that one as well. You should just keep your screen on, Chief, because we're coming back at you. Um, again, through you, uh, Your Worship, uh, to the Councillor, um, the process, we, we're working out the process right now to try to um, ensure that none of our staff are in a precarious situation that they would be required to ask any specific questions with regards to whether they are vaccinated or whether they're not. The process that we're working towards is that uh, any staff person who is chairing the meeting or if the staff person is coming to work and they need to advise their supervisor, if you will, that the process will either indicate whether they can enter the facility or workplace. That is two ways. Either they, are, they have shown proof of their vaccination or the other way is that they've provided a valid rapid test prior to entering the building. So when it, we deal with hours, how many hours is that? Uh, 
Uh, right now, we're in our EOC, we're uh, in, in consultation with our HR department. We are, we are saying that as long as you have proven, have provided a test prior to you arriving, and uh, you know, obviously it's date stamped and validated, um, then that would uh, permit you, and that you've passed the screening questions as, uh, as uh, uh, Councillor Cario had, had suggested, um, that would allow you to enter in any of our city facilities. And that would reassure those within that meeting or workplace that they've uh, adhered to the policy. Does that answer your question, Councillor? Not exactly. <laughs> um, I was looking prior, if it's a Thursday meeting, how much prior can they give a, a rapid test? Now, I know you're not going to show everybody, but to get in the building, you have to show someone. And what is that person saying, oh, you had a test yesterday, it's okay, or it was last Sunday? What is the time frame? That's all I was looking for. So what we're looking for, I guess, and I see uh, Mr. Darks come on the screen with his hand up, uh, is how long, are you asking is how long is the test valid? Is that what you're saying? So how long is the test valid for? What, what's our policy going to be in that regard? Trent, did you want to do this one? Yeah, yeah through the chair. Um, we have having discussions about looking at a 72 hour window uh, prior to the uh, start of the shift. Uh, we're still working uh, through the uh, logistics on that. So uh, yeah, well, that's, that's kind of what we're looking at, that we got uh, valid test results uh, around 72 hours prior to uh, them entering the uh, facility, but uh, we're still working out those logistics. Um, and one of the, I just want to reemphasize, you know, that all our, as Councillor Cario said, all our, our screening procedures remain uh, in place um, and very important during this time, whether people are uh, vaccinated or not. Uh, we're, we continue to step up our, our screening, our, our cleaning, our, we got hand wash stations everywhere. We've got our, uh, our social distancing policy. So we haven't uh, relaxed our, our, our COVID protocols and we'll continue to do that through this effort to get as many people as vaccinated as possible. And just one other thing I, I'd like to add is that the report says the, the number is 61%. Uh, that was uh, true as of a Friday, but I can give you an update now that it's it's increased a little, up to 65%. So uh, from now until November uh, 15th, we you know we expect that uh, number to continue to increase. Okay, Councillor Lacoco, is that uh, good? Okay, great. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments of council? So we have a motion by oh, Councillor. Uh, Sorry. Yep. Yep, we've already got a motion by, uh, I think, yourself and Councillor Strange. Is that right or no? Councillor Peter Angelo? Peter Angelo Dabrowski. Uh, Dabrowski, okay. Uh, that we um, receive the report. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Item 7.2, Council Schedule for 2022. Looking for a approval? Yep, yep. motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. Discussion to the motion, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I said this at the last year, I, I didn't think that there were enough meetings scheduled. Quite often, uh, councils meet twice a month. I know that there's a, a statement about that we're meeting every three weeks unless it's a holiday, um, so then we're skipping that. And then because of the election, so when you take the inaugural meeting and then December meeting, which is around the holidays, that one's not a long one. You take the two September and October, really there's only 13 meetings. and. Um, if we look at the last meeting, we were here for almost eight hours. I know you said that if we have a need for a meeting, we can always call one. We never have done that. All of the information just gets stuck on the next council meeting. Uh, I, I would like to see more personally. Okay. Uh, for the record, I have called uh, special meetings many times. So whenever one's required, and if one's ever required, uh, council can also ask for a special meeting. So there are ways of doing that if we do need a special meeting. We haven't done it because of COVID and uh, the extenuating circumstances we've been dealing with, but, but it's, it's been common that I've called special meetings in the past. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, you are correct. There have been special meetings for usually one specific item that something came up that was timely, yeah. but not to have a whole um, agenda of items to break it up between having an eight-hour council meeting. Mm -hmm. So yes, you are correct. 
And I'd say that meeting was the, probably the longest one since you've been on council, I'm guessing, because that was a long one. I remember in past years, we'd have some like that that would go really, really. That was unusual. Yeah, it was. It, it was an unusual one. We had in the past, I remember going like midnight. It was, there were some long ones, but that wasn't too, too bad. I know with the region, it's very common. <laughs> they go too long. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I'm sorry, other hands up on the schedule thing? No? Okay, so uh, looking for, uh, did, did we have a motion? Where would, I'm sorry, we already have the motion. Moved by who again? Thompson. Councillor Thompson and Councillor Dabrowski, or Councillor who? Dabrowski? Yeah. yeah, okay. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's uh, approved. Moving on to property tax, penalty, and interest. Uh, we've got a report with a recommendation. Uh, what's the will of, so the, the history, we've lowered the rate down, especially during COVID, businesses have been uh, suffering. Staff are saying, you know, we've got a little bit of a shortfall if we do that. So now we've come where they're asking us for more direction. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think, uh, we're still in the pandemic, and uh, I would suggest or make a motion that we go to 1% uh, for the next six months and then have a debate about it at that time, okay? Okay, we've got a motion seconded by Councilor Dabrowski that we go from the current rate to 1%, which would be 12% per year, uh, and then we revisit it in six months. Do we have any discussion to that motion? Uh, Councillor Kerry. Your Worship, um, just a question to the move in the seconder. There are, uh, if you read the other reports, there are other municipalities that that's their rate. I, I think that that's their rate, 1%. There's a half a dozen municipalities that that's their rate. I just don't know why we want to revisit it in six months. I, I think that, I don't think I'd be comfortable going more than... Pandemic. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm suggesting that we leave it at that rate and not go back up to one and a quarter and that we that we stick with that rate of one percent, not go above it. One. one. That's that's what that's what your motion is to go to one. My my question is why do you want to revisit it again? Why don't we just go to one? Then the staff can set their goals, their their um, budgeting and whatever. Uh, we won't be fifteen percent, we'll be twelve percent. It, it, it won't really satisfy a lot of people, but it's better than 15%. So I'll support the motion either way. I just don't know why we want to revisit it. Yeah, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, we're still in a pandemic and a lot of people are really suffering and a little bit of consideration at this time, I think is appropriate. And then we'll deal with it in six months. Hopefully things will be better. I'll support the motion, Your Worship. Okay, do we, do we have any other comments or concerns? Okay, all right, we'll, we'll call the vote then. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm, it was moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by? The bro, sorry, thank you. Uh, we'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, that's unanimous, thank you for that. Uh, item 7.4, road closure request, BIA, Conflict. Conflict, Councillor Lococo, uh, Councillor uh, Campbell. <clears throat> Your Worship, uh, yes. I know the uh, BIA members are meeting right at this moment. Um, I, I have a strong sense that there's going to be some changes in the request. Uh, I would like to defer this to later on in the meeting, uh, just before new business perhaps. Okay. Um, so that they can get the information to me. And uh, I think I think the biggest problem is uh, we can't defer it to the next meeting because yeah. we're, we're missing out on grants and a whole bunch of other things that have to come into play. So uh, if, if I could make a motion to defer it to the end of the meeting. Okay, so we have a motion second by Councilor Strange that we move this to the end of the meeting. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, done. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Item 7.5, future, is that where we are? Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, thank you for that. So item 7.5 is a future strategic growth direction intensification target. Um, Mr. Herlovich, uh, I believe is here, and I think Mr. Felicetti is here as well. 
So, Mr. Hurlovich, did you want to um, present this? Yes, here we go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just uh, bringing this to the beginning of our presentation. Uh, thank you. I have uh, Mr. Uh, Brian Dick with me as well. He's the city's manager of policy. And this uh, report prepared by staff for council uh, deals with uh, Niagara Falls strategic growth direction. It's a response to a report uh, prepared by the region PDS 33-2021, which uh, allocates uh, population across Niagara Falls, or across Niagara Region, rather, for the next 30 years. And so what we're talking about is basically the dispersal of um, population and housing uh, to 2051. So this first slide really depicts our current situation. So we have a built boundary, which is outlined with a red circle. Inside of that, we have uh, a number of established houses. That's the built-up area. And there is uh, there are opportunities represented by the darker houses that would be infill situations. And surrounding the built boundary are what the areas we call greenfield development. And so it's how much greenfield development do we want versus how much uh, development do we direct inside the built boundary. So the background and context, as I said, the region has prepared uh, this report um, and they're developing their new official plan. So the preliminary growth allocations for 2051 as they anticipate the region will grow to 694,000 people and 272,000 jobs region wide over the next 30 years. They've allocated a, uh, a population in Niagara Falls to 2051 that would have us grow to 141,650, sorry, 650 uh, residents, there's an extra zero in there, and um, 58,110 jobs. So that's, in, if you look at the, uh, the blue bubble, uh, that's basically an increase of 44,430 people and an increase of 20,330 jobs. Uh, we support these uh, projections for Niagara Falls. We believe this is uh, a um, very beneficial uh, target for us to aim towards. And uh, so the region is looking uh, for our uh, feedback on these numbers and the other numbers that we'll be going through tonight. So what does the future look like? So the city's housing needs supply report provided the following uh, key uh, findings. This, this was a report presented to Council in June of this year. Our population is aging. Household size is getting smaller. 35% of the city's population is older than 55, which is 5% above the provincial average. And we believe this trend will likely continue. Housing, and I don't need to tell anybody this, is becoming less affordable. Almost half of the city's population earns less than $60,000 uh, per year before taxes. 86% of the households would not be able to afford the price of a newly built home. Uh, the region's CANSIA report uh, that concluded that core housing need will get worse if the continued, region continues to grow at the existing level and form of housing. For instance, 57% of all rental households in the city today are uh, below, um, are in core housing need. And 23% of owned households are in core need. This means they're spending more than 30% of their income on households or their houses in disrepair or there are no alternative uh, places for them to live. So that's um, a large percentage of, of our housing, um, of our households rather. Uh, as well, the city's housing needs supply report recommended that 40% of all new built houses be targeted to households earning less than $84,000 annually. So that's our target that we set in June. The um, housing needs to 2025, the region projects that 20,210 new housing units will be uh, needed over the next 30 years 
to accommodate the 44,430 people allocated to Niagara Falls. So if we break that down, or the region broke that down further, they are estimating that that would be 11,980 single and semi-detached homes, 5,090 townhouse units, and 3,140 uh, units. Um, that's a distribution of almost 60% of the new housing would be in the form that uh, most households in the city cannot afford. You know, when we look at what we're wanting to uh, target, and that is the whole housing continuum. Uh, Cancia's report for the region uh, did a housing analysis. They concluded that more dense forms of housing are needed to improve affordability. The regional draft forecast for the city focus on single and semi-detached dwellings, and that will not address our affordability issues. So if we look at our homelessness at one end of the spectrum and large single detached houses on the other end of the spectrum, what we're looking at is that affordable mi middle, the walk-up apartments, the townhouses, the higher uh, density forms of development. So a broader mix of housing in the form of townhouses and apartments is required to diversify the housing stock and improve affordability. There were two options considered. So the first option is that proposed by the region in report uh, PDS 33 2021 that I mentioned earlier on. So they're proposing that the distribution of housing would have 50% of the housing in the in um, intensification that is within the built boundaries inside of that red circle. That's 11,980 uh, singles and semis, 5,090 townhouses, 3,140 um, apartment units. The distribution I outlined earlier so is almost 60% singles and semis. Planning staff are proposing an option two for council's consideration and this would have a distribution of housing where 65% of all new houses would be in the built boundary within that red circle. That equates to 9,095 units or 45% of all housing would be singles and semis. 6,669 units, 33% as townhouses and 4,446 or 22% um, would be apartments. These figures were not worked out exclusively by us. We work with regional staff to come up with these numbers to be able to present this to council. So we're really talking about a difference of 2,885 single um, or semi-detached houses over a 30-year period. That's less than 100 units per year um, of singles. So we're asking you just shift the mix slightly. Um, and this is what this would look like. Uh, council was asking for more visuals. Uh, so here's a depiction of, on the left is 50% intensification, uh, so a large percentage singles and semis, and on the right, um, a more balanced approach at 65% um, of intensification. As well, what does this area actually mean? So 50% of intensification would be, um, place the city in a requirement of needing 272 hectares more greenfield lands. That's more than 1.6 times the transit station area uh, shown on the uh, drawing or the plan on the left. So uh, that, this is the area that's basically um, a, a uh, one and a half to two kilometers from the GO station. The, uh, at 65% uh, intensification, we would require 113 additional hectares of greenfield land. That's 0.7% of the transit area. So basically, one and a half percent for 50% and about 75% for the 113 acres. Um, so in, as well, where does the intensification occur? So our official plan already identifies a number of intensification corridors, Thorlstone Road and Portage, Victoria Avenue, Lundy's Lane, Dunn Street, McLeod Road. 
We have intensification nodes. The downtown around the GO station, Five Corners, Stamford, uh, Drummondville, and Dor uh, Dorchester Morrison, around the, um, the Canadian Tire Home Depot and former Acres site. There are other opportunities for intensification as well. Ground fields, uh, former industrial lands, gray fields, former commercial lands. Uh, we have a large amount of, of vacant commercial land, like for instance, the Canadian Tire on, the, on Montrose Road. Uh, Bluefield lands, these would be former ins institutional lands. Right now we have the redevelopment of Diamond Jubilee School on uh, Dorchester Road as an example of intensification of Bluefield lands. And it would also include lands like uh, Greater Niagara General Hospital uh, when it relocates to its new south at Bigger and Montrose. And then lastly, intensification could occur through in, uh, accessory apartments. So the intensification rates really affect the distribution of housing units. The more units in the built up area uh, is not only more sustainable fiscally, environmentally and socially, but it'll provide a broader range of housing types that are needed by the residents. Again, to help council visualize what this means, so in the top left corner is a picture of a 24 unit apartment builder on Kaler Road. This represents 74 units per hectare in a greenfield development. Um, project on the top, upper right, uh, Morrison Street is 18 units. This is 62 units a hectare in the form of intensification. Portage Road is 70 units. Uh, unit building, that's 129 units per hectare. Uh, and this is in the intensification note. This is the form of development that intensification would be pushing forward. Uh, Phillips Street, six units, 99 um, units per hectare. This is the form of development that we would expect to see. And I admit this is an older building, but this is what we're talking about in terms of intensifying in our built up areas. And then lastly, Buckley Towers, um, 200 units, that's 410 units a hectare. This is the kind of development we're talking about for downtown in the GO station area. So these are what our intensification uh, needs actually look like when represented visually. Um, we believe that 65% intensi intensification rate will incre increase diversification of the city's housing stock. It will provide a variety of housing types needed for residents across the affordability spectrum. It will increase the number of units located within built boundary built up area, such as the current intensification occurring along McLeod Road and the future redevelopment of the downtown. It will increase transit ridership and service, it improves walkability of our communities, it rehabilitates brownfields and uses vacant um, urban lands. It would maximize the efficiency of existing infrastructure, that is water and sewer, and it will improve water quality with less strain on stormwater quali quality and quantity. What we believe urban expansion of Greenfield will, will do is it will result in the loss of agricultural lands and agriculturally related industries. It will add increased pressure on our natural resources. It will add to the city's infrastructure deficit as we need to provide and maintain additional infrastructure such as roads, fire safety, community services across a larger geographic area. It will detract from the downtown redevelopment, uh, which we intend for support of the GO station. Uh, will not diversify the housing stock or improve the housing affordability. It will not provide housing for the city's service sector workforce. The next steps outlined in the report upon council's endorsement of either option one which is 50% intensification, or option two, 65% intensification. The region will be notified of the city's requested intensification rate and the corresponding greenfield lands. The intensification target selected by council will play a key role in the region's upcoming settlement area boundary review. And that will determine where it is most appropriate uh, location for the city's urban area to expand and to accommodate our 2051 forecasted population. This new target will be formally implemented through the city's new upcoming official plan to be started late next year. 
at any point the city is under the provincial growth plan has the opportunity to request 40 uh, hectare urban boundary expansion outside of any municipal comprehensive review. So we could do that at any time should it be determined that additional lands are needed. So the recommendations of planning staff are that council endorse the regional forecast of 44,430 additional people and 20,330 new jobs for the city by 2051. The council endorse option two, direct 65% of the city's future housing growth to the city's built up areas and that the staff be directed to notify the region of the preferred intensification target to help guide the region's upcoming settlement area boundary review assessment. And those are the highlights of that report. Thank you, Mr. Hulovic, Councillor Lococo, and then Councillor Cario. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to thank staff for putting this report together. I know a lot of work has gone into it from the housing needs um, to, to this, um, the housing direction study. There's a lot of alarming statistics in, the, in this report. 40% um, of our jobs are accommodation, food service, and rental and, and uh, retail settings. Almost half of our household before taxes uh, earn $60,000. 86% of Niagara Falls residents can't afford a pr the price of a brand new home. Um, so I would support the recommendation of going to the 65% and um, I would put that motion forward and then after we have a vote, I have a, a couple other, other comments if I could. Okay, we have a motion from Councillor Lococo. I would second that. Moving the three recommendations that are there in the staff report. Okay, we have a second by Councillor Iannone. Do we have any discussions to the motion? We've got Councillor Cario, and then Thompson, and then Strange. Well, Your Worship, I can't support intensification of 65%. Um, having talked to many of the developers and builders in our, in our city, they don't agree with a lot of things that are in the report. It's a great report, but they believe that we need to get our urban boundaries expanded. And uh, it has to be a combination of expansion, but too much intensification, Your Worship, I can't support it. Week after week after week after meetings, uh, we're supposed to be representing the people that live in our municipality. Developers come down to our city with uh, wanting to uh, intensify in the areas that they're that they are um, single-family homes and build up around the, the single-family homes. And some of the biggest battles that this council has had is because people want to put too many units uh, near. Uh, existing single family dwellings or areas that um, usually don't have as much intensification. So I've always, and many of the people around the table at council have always said, you know, uh, it's the province that's done this. It's the province that's pushing this intensification on you, not us. Well, I don't want to be part of having it go one step further and rather having to face a group of people living in an area that are facing a 200 unit apartment building uh, on a little piece of empty land beside them facing a 400 unit apartment building uh, in that same area beside them. So I don't believe it's right for Niagara. I believe that we need to expand the urban boundaries more. Uh, most of the developers and builders will say the problem with pricing is because we've been held to the urban boundaries that we are right now for way too long. And the province has resisted expanding the urban boundaries land prices have gone through the roof because there's no land. Uh, I don't believe that we should be pushing uh, in intensification on the people in our town that don't want it. I won't support the 65% you worship. Okay, thank you for that. I've got Councillor Thompson and then Strange. Yeah, well, I'm gonna have the same comments. Um, um, intensification, uh, you saw again tonight, 39 apartment. All the people are upset about it in single family homes. We have all kinds of people that approach us and say, uh, I have some great land outside the urban boundary and I would like to develop it. And uh, I think if we go 65 in the urban boundaries, uh, we're gonna cut those people off and our opportunity to expand uh, with the urban boundaries. I think uh, we can do 
50, probably 40, uh, rather than 65, and we're going to be able to get the expansion of the urban boundaries. We have all kinds of road at the edge of the properties, uh, urban boundary, that have services there and houses just on one side of the road. We could expand that and uh, really utilize that. So I am not going to, 65 is not my number. Thank you for that. I've got Councilor Strange then. It's not your, what's your number? Wayne? <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I, I, you look at the report and it's a great report. I just, you know, I can't imagine the, the forecast of 44,430 additional people in our city, what we have right now. You know, we, we saw a couple development, one development today was a five story and, you know, people are upset about that. We know that we have to intensify, but I think to intensify it and try to fit 44 more thousand people into what we have right now in our boundary, I think it's impossible. And you'll just see more seven story, eight stories besides single families. And you want to be voting on that all the time, you're going to be having some upset people. So I think it's time that, you know, it, you know I would like to, to see that, that number down to about 45, 50%, like Councillor Thompson said, and uh, eventually we're gonna have to actually ex expand towards that end. You know, you see where the hospital is, all the development there. So I think it's something that, uh, you know, we're, we're not gonna have a choice. So I can't support the way it is right now. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Dabrowski. Yeah, just to echo those comments, we, we yeah. did see it with the St. Paul Avenue um, proposal that went through, but. A number of traffic concerns I can imagine at 65% if you know just thinking off the top of my head areas within the city whether it be McLeod Road or St. Paul Avenue there's room for development it's just let's look at expanding that urban boundary I agree um, I can't see that 65% I'm not sure if that number is 40% or 50% I know option one outlines 50% maybe we could revisit that whether we see uh, um, Councillor Iannone's motion go through but uh, either way great report um, great growth within our city, which is great to see, a great forecast coming out of the region, but uh, either way, can't support the motion, but uh, look at uh, hoping to see some other options come our way. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've heard half a dozen comments on how we would have developments before us like we just did on St. Paul. Here, we passed it. There might have been residents there who were upset about it, but we passed it anyway. And I think that this past whole weekend from Thursday on, there, there had been a climate, a climate summit saying that can't that we are not municipalities and, and cities are not fundamentally planning based on the climate emergency that there is now. So we have so little green space that we're just going to go continue expand the urban boundaries, um, plow down all the trees, all the environmental um, pluses that help control climate change, and we're just going to turn a blind eye to um, the climate emergency that Canada just declared. I'm actually pulling it up on my phone while I speak to you so that I could have quoted it. And it was just uh, two days ago, a month, yesterday, Monday at the 4th, how Canadian, many Canadians live in climate risk areas and don't know it. Well, we do know it because we're hearing it all the time. We're reading it. it it's on Canadian news. I'm trying to stay away from the states. Canadian news all the time. And we want to talk about extending our urban boundaries and, again, taking more down more green space and just pay, make nothing but concrete. And maybe i'm talking to massively different people than everybody else is but i'm hearing people say we're going to have no green space left in our city or on the outside we're going to just be a continuous city to st catherine's and they don't want to see that happen so that's why i supported councillor lococo's motion and you know we're, i'm watching other municipalities within our region declare climate emergencies and we aren't even addressing climate uh, we aren't addressing the environment we aren't addressing anything like that at our council we just want to continue to build and pave and i think we're in the wrong direction okay thank you for that um okay um councillor campbell uh thank you your worship uh, i'm glad there was discussion because initially i was prepared to support the 65 percent but as i i heard from everyone else um 
there's the potential of us being at some time in the future, not my future, but future, downtown Niagara Falls is going to be like downtown Toronto. And I think that we, we, we can't go with the 65%. That would be unbearable. That could change somewhere in the future, not by this vote tonight, but by a future vote by another council, depending on if the people did move into this community. So I, I can't support the motion. Okay, thank you for that. Well, I think we should call the vote uh, if there's no further comments. Everyone's had a chance to speak. So the motion is to move the Can I have it recorded, please? Recorded motion, uh, Mr. Clark. Okay, hey, the motion on the floor is to support the recommendations contained within uh, report PBD 2021-53. Councillor Campbell. Against. Councillor Dabrowski. No. Councillor Iannone. I believe you are in favor. Yes. Councillor Kirio. No. Councillor Lococo. In favor. Councillor Peter Angelo is there. thank you conflict councillor strange against councillor thompson no and mayor diodati and i'm opposed and that motion is defeated okay looking for another motion yes councillor lacoco thank you mr mayor in, in the thoughts of providing more alternative um alternatives for housing to our, our residents. Um, I'd like to bring up, I have two motions, so I'll, I'll go through them. Over the past few years, we've discussed inclu inclusionary zoning. I think it's a good time to revisit inclusionary zoning. Councillor, we're gonna we're dealing with this uh, report right now. So we've got three recommendations. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I thought since it was. No, so now we're gonna, I'm gonna entertain another motion to this. Okay, I'll come back later, I'm sorry. And then we can come sorry. back to that, inclusionary zoning. Uh, do we have a direction or a motion from a member of council for option two, one, or whatever it is? I was going to make a motion for option one. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, councilor. It, it sounded like the, the consensus around the table with fellow councillors was a 65% was too high. I'm thinking option one um, might be uh, more consistent with the thought process around the table, so I'll make a motion to uh, entertain option one. Okay, we've got a motion. Or support it. Motion by Councillor Dabrowski to go with option one, 50%, seconded by Councillor Campbell. Do we have any discussion to that motion? Okay, we'll call the vote. Recorded Always vote, please. A recorded vote. And just before you uh, call the vote, Mr. Clerk, since I'm voting on this as well and I didn't speak on it, uh, just briefly, uh, my rationale for why I'm supporting this. Right now we're at 40%. This goes up 10% to 50%. That's consistent with the what the region is recommending for all the municipalities. Uh, we can easily have our um, target at 50 at 50%. 50 we can have an internal target higher if we choose. And I like the idea of certain areas intensified as we're doing. We already did the zoning for downtown and certain intensification areas. So I think this is the best of both worlds. We need to expand, we've got the room to expand. And part of the problem that we're dealing with, the crisis right now, and a lot of people that maybe don't understand, it's a simple issue of supply and demand. And the more you restrict the supply, the price goes up and it becomes less affordable. So we have a climate crisis, we have affordable housing crisis. So I think this is a fair compromise of the two sides, and that's where my rationale is coming from, Mr. Clark. So I'm prepared now, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the motion on the floor then is to approve recommendation number one in report PBD 2021-53 to uh, change recommendation number two to state that council endorse option number one to direct 50% of the city's future housing growth to be directed to the city's built up area and then to also approve recommendation number three within the report. Uh, Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Dabrowski? Yes. Councillor Iannone? Opposed. Councillor Curio? In favor. Councillor Lococo? Opposed. Councillor Peter Angel has a declared conflict. Councillor Strange? In favor. Councillor Thompson? 
In favor. And Mayor Duodati. I'm in favor as well. And that carries. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Councilor, now I'm thinking that probably most appropriate would probably be under new business, unless you think there's a specific reason it should be at this point. Yes, I think it, there is a direct tie into this. Um, if I read my motion and you feel that it's not, but it's a direct I'll let the tie into the, to the growth okay. plan. So go ahead okay. and read your motion. Um, so over the past few years, we yeah. briefly discussed uh, d discuss inclusionary zoning. I think it's a great time yeah, to ahead, revisit Councilor. it with in, in conjunction to the growth direction report and the housing needs report. Inclusionary zoning would assist the city with creation of affordable housing, and we would be able to specify how many units and how they would be created. There are many factors to look at, such as what is the percentage? Do we do 5%, 10%, 25%, or something else? What demographic are we aiming for? What annual household income? Conditions, how is the region involved? Are there subsidies? We need to consult developers, organizations and the public. This could be a win-win situation to address this report. Um, I would like to put the motion forward that staff bring back a report regarding the possibilities and options of inclusionary zoning. This would include information such as percentage, demographics, annual household income, conditions, involvement of the region, consultation with developers, organizations, public, and any other relevant information. So okay, we've already got a second by Councillor Strange. Uh, I think that's in order and I think it's consistent with what we're dealing with. So is there any discussion to the motion for asking for a report on inclusionary zoning? Okay, seeing none, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Uh, that's approved unanimously. Thank you. Thank Council. you. And my second motion, it, it ties in exactly to it. Another alternative that we can look into is tiny homes. Not a village, not a compound, but in individual tiny homes on a lot. This may not be a good alternative for families, but it might be a perfect, um, perfect solution for an individual or even a couple, depending on the size. Other communities have amended their bylaws in order to allow tiny homes and bring more housing options. They could be prefabricated, built on site, on wheels, shipping containers, etc. I would like to put a motion forward that staff bring back a report regarding tiny homes. This would include information such as the type which could be prefabricated, built on site, on wheel, shipping containers, et cetera. House size and height, lot size, zoning requirements, which would include setbacks and parking, building code and planning act requirements, service such as water, sewer, electricity, permits, development charges, rezoning or minor variation, variance information, and any other relevant information. I'd like to put that motion. Richard. Okay, we've got a motion by Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Can I Lococo. speak to that? Yes, and seconded by Councillor Campbell. Uh, Councillor Lococo. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor uh, Iannone. Thank you. And we have talked about tiny homes over the span of many years here. And it was always in conjunction with um, the most vulnerable, the homeless. People are, are, average people, couples are choosing to downsize because you cannot afford to buy a single family home. We've seen the, the, the extreme high percentage who can't afford that in the city to buy a new single family home. And this has become an affordable method for just couples starting out. And even families are converting from big homes to tiny houses. So I think this is a huge step for the city in order to pr provide true affordable housing and not just for the most vulnerable, but for families who are finding that the economy's become too much for them to be able to afford their their normal living situation. So I think this is a great move for the city. Okay. Any other discussion to the, yes, Councillor DeBrow? <coughs> Sorry, I didn't, what was the motion exactly? That were report. for report on time For a report on all of those things that okay. I listed. And, and just, my memory serves me correct, two or three years ago, Councillor Iannone and Lacoca went to Texas. For, and maybe you can come back along with that report and give a report back to council. I know there. Well, I remember a lot of information around tiny homes. I'm not sure what the the homeless committee is working on right now. But anyway, looking forward to seeing the report. I'm not sure if it fits within our city landscape, but at the same time, looking forward to uh, an update on your trip out to Texas two or three years back and and what uh, what the staff report will hold. So I'll um, I'll support the motion. And I see Councillor Iannone's hand up. Okay, thank you for that, um, Councillor Iannone. Thank you. And we did come back and give a, a concisive and comprehensive report to council. It was actually a PowerPoint on the screen. Um, and, and when you talk about 
it not being the landscape of Niagara Falls, that's what the problem is. Um, we have a lot of families here who these could be solutions and they may have land that they cannot build a tiny house on. And, and, and what defines a tiny house? Per, generally it's 500 square feet and under. But there are, there are families building homes that are 700 square feet. They don't fit into the 20, the 2,000 or 3,000 square foot home in a neighborhood, but they could pro possibly afford and are looking for to build 700 square feet homes so that they can live in. Um, it, it's not just a trend in other countries. It is a huge movement in, in Canada also. So when we talk about maybe it doesn't fit in the landscape of Niagara Falls, that's why we're bringing it forward tonight. We need to find ways for affordable housing to fit in the landscape of Niagara Falls. And, and while we can bring back information on mobile loaves and fishes, because I really believe that we lost a huge opportunity. When Councilor Lecoque, when I came back and did a concisive and very comprehensive report, we were told affordable housing was not the jurisdiction of the city. That, that was the end result of that night. So I'd be happy, I'm sure as with Councillor Lecoq will be happy and come talk about the success Austin, Texas has had with mobile loaves and fishes. Can we do it on uh, yeah. off Pardon me? Can we do it on off night or can we do it on off night? Councillor uh, uh Just point of correction. I, I didn't say it wasn't the landscape for Niagara Falls. So I said I'm not sure if it is. And looking forward to the report back and hopefully uh, your memory serves you correct from three years ago but looking forward to the report I know it's not just a movement um, it's a strategy for not a lot of municipalities across Canada and the US I'm just not sure we're, we're able to accommodate it here but always looking for ways to increase affordable housing so appreciate you bringing the motion forward thanks okay thank you for that Councillor Peter Angelo well your worship I was just going to mention that I believe the final report for the city's housing strategy is still coming back and that housing strategy is also supposed to make a number of different recommendations um, just like the recommendations that are on the floor right now so I'm not sure if it's possible to consolidate everything instead of having it um, you know come back one piece at a time maybe Mr. Herlovich can can speak better to it but I believe that the final recommendations for the housing strategy are still on, on their way back to this council yep. Mr. Herlovich did you want to weigh in on this please Is he there? Yep. Mr. Levitch, are you there? Can you hear us? Sorry, could, could you repeat the question? Councillor Peter Angel? <laughs> Your Worship, I was just mentioning the fact that the final recommendations for the city's housing strategy are still on their way back to council. Um, so I was just saying perhaps we could consolidate everyone's ideas into our final recommendations to council that's all okay mr that was the question did you get that uh sure. <laughs> yes thank you we'll refer it back to uh dylan and watson for their uh their final report that we'll be bringing back Okay, Council, uh, Council De Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to bring, um, when I was discussing with Mr. Hurlovich about a bunch of different ideas about inclusionary zoning and tiny homes, one of the comments that Mr. Hurlovich made was that Ian DeYoung did not support tiny homes for support for affordable housing. And what I was saying was, I'm looking at an individual lot with one tiny home. What Ian DeYoung, or DeJong, sorry, uh, was talking about was a compound or, or village that we're sharing resources. So they are two different things. Um, if the housing committee could talk specifically about this, but that's not what they were talking about before. This is a different idea. They were talking about um, compounds, shared resources. So I don't know if they've done any research on this. This is talking about rezoning uh, minor variances. So it is a little bit different. Okay. Any follow-up, Councillor Peter Angel? No? Yeah, and I would hope too, you mentioned uh, Ian DeYoung, that we'd have his input as well. Because yeah, because he was, uh, he did speak against tiny homes. And maybe you're saying, as you're saying, in the context of more than one in an area, because he talked about how that's been done and it failed. So maybe as you're saying, if it's one at the back of your lot, that might be a different uh, model. We just know that subdivisions of tiny homes, he doesn't support. I spoke with him a couple times about it. He's very much opposed to it. 
Yes, that, that's correct, and that's why I, want, I would like this to be a completely separate motion than what uh, Mr. De Jong was talking about f before. Okay, and, and you're asking just for a report? Just a report with all of that information, and I find it very helpful because when I've been looking for the information about inclusionary zoning, you look at the building code, you look at the planning act, you look at the official, uh, the official plan, the information is all scattered. If we have a report, everything will be there, and then we will have suggestions from our staff about how we could benefit from it or how maybe it won't work, but at least it will all be in one place and the same thing with the tiny homes. And are you comfortable, Councillor, also including uh, some feedback from Ian DeYoung on this yes. as well? Yes, okay. and, and uh, when I said uh, any uh, relevant information, yep. that could including, be the relevant. Okay, great. Yes. Okay, great. So are you okay with that to the seconder? Okay, thank you. So we've got the motion asking for a staff report. Uh, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Thank you for that. Okay, moving on to the consent agenda. What is the will of council? Okay. Which number is that? Uh, uh, FW Sixty-seven. Okay. Anybody want anything else pulled? Okay. Sure. Do, let's just. Why don't we just deal with those ones? So let's deal with first MW twenty twenty one dash sixty seven, and um, maybe we could uh, get Mr. Uh, Nickel. If you would mind uh, maybe addressing, or did you have any questions specific first, Councillor, and then we can get Mr. Nickel to kind of weigh and, in on it. Maybe even through um, you to Mr. Nickel. A couple of concerns I've heard from residents. There was a survey done. There was some uh, survey results that came out of it. Um, just Cole's notes of the report, there was a basketball net or pole that was vandalized. Um, Mr. Nickel, maybe he can clarify if it was vandalized during the provincial shutdown order. Yep, Mr. Nickel when parks were shut down um, by the province back in 2020. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and to the councillor. I actually don't have the uh, specific timing of the, uh, that vandalism. I do recall, it's been, it seems like it's been a long time ago, so I don't Fall. think it was before uh, March of last year, so my likelihood it was uh, after uh, March of 2020. Yeah, it was fall 2020. I just wasn't sure if that vandalism came out of um, some ruffians just, you know, having some fun at the park, or whether or not it was just due to some anger by residents um, with the uh, the mandatory park closures provincially. Either way, my another question I have um, is just in terms of like-minded parks across the municipality, how many don't have a basketball court or net installed? And when I mean basketball net, I, I mean regulation, not not the one that's outlined in the report as the uh, children's ball game. Mr. Nickel. Yeah, and through you, Mr. Mayor, so I hope I understand the question. Um, I could speak specifically for Niagara Falls. Um, I would say we have a fairly high level of service with our park amenities. So we've been working through our operation, um, oper awesome playgrounds. And every time we review a park, we look at distribution of those half court basketball nets, such as this one, and where we have a location that's somewhat efficient and we have the budget to do it, we've been adding these new basketball courts in. Um, so I would say it compared to, you know, other municipalities, we're probably have a higher level of standard. Um, in Niagara Falls, though, we still have another, another uh, outstanding locations that um, still need to have theirs upgraded as well. Um, unless we have some, uh, um, you know, full courts uh, that need some resurfacing. So, um, Councillor, I hope I got your question. No, I, I, you, know, you, you, had, you gave me a lot of information, which was useful. My question, I guess, was in terms of parks, like-minded parks within our municipality, how many of those parks don't have a basketball net installed? Is it more usual for a park to have a basketball net installed? Yeah, and, and thanks, Councillor. So it, it is, uh, I, would, I would call it an enhancement to a typical park with a playground, um, not a standard. Okay, so what's a standard? Either way, I looked at the report. Thanks, Mr. Nickel. The survey, basically showcases 50% of the respondents still want a basketball net installed. Basketball, it was founded here in our country of Canada by James Naismith. Um, the basketball play court or games that you want to install, they're great, but anyone under the age of nine won't play that game. You don't really see it um, 
as part of a, an organized sport across the city or any city. I would just hate to, to take away my favorite game growing up as a kid was basketball. It's where people congregate. I know there was uh, some vandalism issues. Um, I'm aware of that. Maybe we can look at some sort of motion lighting to maybe deter from that. Either way, I can't support um, the report as outlined. I, I don't want to defer it if the, the, uh, the will of councils to, to move ahead with the report, great. But I would just hate to see the children around that neighborhood lose access to a basketball court. Again, the, the, what's outlined here in terms of the play net and the other ball game, I guess we'll call it, it's just not conducive to anyone over the age of eight. Um, it's a bit childish, which is fine. I know it, it will cater to a lot of children under the age of eight, but for teenagers and anyone looking to improve their basketball game, I would hate for that um, neighborhood to lose the, the basketball net, especially when the survey clearly states that almost 50% of people wanted that net to stay and uh, only about 30% wanted something else installed and 20% of people I think mentioned other. Um, but either way, hoping, um, I don't want to, you know, make state my case here, but again, would love to see the basketball net stay. We'll wait to hear from my other council members and hopefully we can vote on this and, and move forward. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carrier. Uh, just a comment, I don't want to pull at your worship, but I, I appreciate the, the report about the petition procedures. And thank to Mr. Madsen, uh, it'll be good to get that in place. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, back to the basketball sure. one though. Uh, what's the, the direction petition of- Petition procedures. Uh, yeah. For council, um, back to Garner Park basketball court. There is a recommendation, three recommendations from staff, basically that they put in one of these multi-sport goal children's ball game versus a full regulation basketball net. Because uh, we had vandalism, it was cut down. Uh, we did do petitions. Some people want it to stay, some don't. So there's a recommendation from staff that we do put in a basketball type of net but it's not a regular basketball net so there is a, a recommend three recommendations of staff so we do need to address that one hmm. so uh, we heard from councilor dabrowski it'd be nice if we could hear from I'll some other okay motion by councilor peter angelo that we move the recommendation second by councilor Cario. do we have any further discussion to the recommendations okay seeing none we'll call the vote all those in favor okay and that's approved okay thank you for and one opposed one opposed. Thank you for that. And uh, anything else? So you spoke to the petition, Councillor Cario. Is there anything else you want to speak to on the consent agenda? Or no? Did you want to move the whole consent agenda, Councillor Thompson? No, I want to. Oh, you want to talk to one? Okay, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to thank the clerk for all of the effort that he did with re regarding the petition issue. That was a major, major problem. Have we ever put a factual story uh, on a paper about what was done there? And uh, it was going on for almost two years. Um, it didn't even have the proper property, a four-story, one apartment, and it was online and it was uh, people in Portugal and all over um, Ontario and uh, in the states using it. Uh, are we going to be able to control this by what you have here? Mr. Clerk, with this uh, new direction, are we going to be able to control those types of uh, erroneous situations? Uh, it's uh, your worship. Uh, I think in the absence of a policy or procedure last time, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, a petition made its way to council um, that had uh, names from people that weren't locals. Um, but at the same time, there was no process in place for a petition to come forward. Uh, traditionally, it was done uh, through the agenda process so that council, has, but now we will make this. Yes, okay. we'll make it part of the procedural bylaw and that it does have to come to council via okay. the clerk's office. Thank you. Good job. Yeah, great job. So I've got a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo to move the consent agenda. Yeah, I just wanted to talk oh, about one thing. Sorry, I thought you were okay, go ahead. Um, well, Your Worship, I don't have a problem moving the consent agenda. Um, I, I just, I wanted to talk about the bicycle lanes, uh, not specific to Morrison Street, but just bicycle lanes in general. 
Uh, it's great that we've bought into active transportation and that the city, every time that we reconstruct a road, we look to put in bike lanes. And it's great that the region has the same, um, I guess, mindset right now is to try to put bike lanes in whenever they do reconstruction. My only thought is that um, right now we're a little bit disjointed or not entirely connected in terms of our bike lanes. And have we thought about just actually connecting them so that we at least have a square, a rectangle, something that we can use as an active transportation corridor? I mean, it would be great, Your Worship, to have a route that we could say, this is our, you know, this is our main bicycle route in Niagara Falls. Whether we had two streets that were north-south and two streets that were east-west, that would create that, and it could be a rectangle or it could be a square. Right now, we have bicycle lanes and we're building them as we go, but there's a bicycle lane and then it ends and there's nothing. And then maybe a couple kilometers away, there's another bicycle lane. So again, it, 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 it's a positive in the sense that we're adding them, but we have to get to the point where we then connect them all so that we have an active transportation route. So Do you want to make a motion? We ask staff to give us a report on connecting our bike lanes, municipal and regional for... I'd love that, Your Worship. Like, you geometric know, shapes? I, I think it's important. I mean, especially, uh, I know you started off the meeting saying the mishap of our CAO. Um, you know, yeah. bike lanes offer a sense of security for a lot of people, and they're also a sense of safety. Uh, otherwise, you see people that are on sidewalks all the time, and yeah. that's not really safe to even people that are on the sidewalk. So, and it's against um, the Highway Traffic Act as well. Yeah. yeah, it would be great to have some type of active transportation system, Your Worship. I'd be happy to make that motion, and then you can take the consent agenda one after. Okay, sounds good. So, motion by Councilor Peter Angel that we ask staff to come back with uh, connecting um, our bike lanes into geometric shapes, or is that part just understood? <laughs> All right, uh, second by Councillor Dabrowski. Uh, we'll call the, if there's no discussion to that, we'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. And uh, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Cario that we move the consent agenda. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. So we move on to communications and comments of the city clerk. So item 9.1, integrity commissioner report, Peebles, Peter Angelo. Uh, is there any discussion or what's the direction of council? Councillor uh, Strange and Dabrowski? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was going over to the report, and at, at the very end, they actually, um, the Integrity Commission says, you know, when he's doing his conclusion, for the above reason, it has been term determined to dismiss this matter on the basis of that is vexatious and was as such made in bad faith, meaning that this person had no determination of like trying to win this case, basically just wasting time and wasting effort on uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Now, does the person who made this, who, I, I think it was the old way and paid $200 for this uh, 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 report or to get these IC complaint, do they, does she get her money back for this? Because it, because it's, vexatious and was such made of bad faith, are they not supposed to get their money back? Or, or did they get their money back? Mr. Clerk? Uh, yes, I was looking that over after speaking with uh, Councillor Peter Angelo um, about this matter, and, and I believe I did speak, to, or did state to Mr. Peter Angelo that the money uh, was being returned under the old uh, rules, but when I reviewed the old rules, I, I had uh, uh, not looked at the uh, the fact that it was frivolous and vexatious, which would be a reason not to return the money. So those monies are not being returned. So those monies are uh, not being returned. Correct. Okay. Uh, well, that's, that's great. The, the you know what, this time that this stuff. was filed in March uh, would have still been under the old rules, but uh, I was reminded that that also included frivolous and vexa vexatious, oh, that, that's, that's uh, something that's you know hadn't been shown until this report came out. Well, that's good news. And and do we have any idea how much this particular a report cost has has it come out yet? Uh, through the mayor to the councilor, that invoice has not been received yet. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I've got councilor Dabrowski, then Cario. Yeah, I don't want to uh, drag anything on on this one. Um, I feel bad for councilor Peter Angelo for having to go through this. And I heard through the rumor mill, not a huge deal, but the the complainant Angela Peebles actually doesn't even live in the city. I think when uh, when this report came back. 
I heard that she was living all the way in Vancouver. So it's just unfortunate that we have um, constituents or people that are constituents, then they move away, filing these complaints, wasting time, wasting council's time, wasting staff's time, and, and taxpayers' money. Just what a waste of money on these reports. And the last three or four reports, if you look at the names of people who filed those reports, 95% of the people were either running in a past municipal election or running for federal politics. It's so politically motivated. It has nothing to do with anyone's loyalty or ethics or transparency within city council chambers. It's somebody else trying to get their name in the newspaper and trying to move their political career ahead. And that's just me talking facts. It's, uh, it's irritating. However, I'm glad everybody's keeping their chin up. And more importantly, we just have to move forward, continue to work hard for the taxpayers, and to make this uh, a better place to live, work, and play. So either way, just wanted to note that, and uh, hopefully we can just move forward and put all of these Integrity Commissioner reports behind us and concentrate on the more important things at hand, and that's working around this table. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cario. Thank you, Worship. Just a couple comments. When I read the analysis and decision, of our integrity commissioner, I can't help but think that something is wrong with this process. The applicant can make public unsubstantiated accusations and whether they're right or wrong, there's no way to make them accountable for their actions, no matter how much damage they've done to the person. How is this fair? This certainly is not a fair process, Your Worship. Something's broken. Why should our taxpayers have to pay for this when our integrity commissioner rules that they were not correct with their accusations? Again, Your Worship, after reading the results of this report, the applicant might feel a bit responsible and they might do the right thing and I think that we sh they might feel that they made a mistake and they might feel obligated to contribute to covering the cost. So I'd like to have the same thing happen. I'd like to do the same thing we did for the last ones and ask for a contribution from this person uh, who uh, initiated this thing. Maybe they will, maybe they'll uh, step up and do the right thing and uh, contribute to the cost so that it doesn't, and, uh, that, that the cost is not totally borne by our taxpayers. So I'd like to make that a motion. Okay, motion by Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Strange, that we ask the person who filed the report to contribute to the cost, like to contribute to the cost. Well, you know the cost of the report. Okay, and speakers to that, I've got Councillor Iannone and then Lacoco. Hi. I can't believe you've got a motion like this on the floor. Uh, first, I'd like to ask the legal opinion as to whether the Municipal Act even allows us to do this. Ask the Ombudsman's Office if we're making this prohibitive, because to me this is just a scarce tactic so that people don't file complaints. And interestingly enough, nobody asked Mr. DeLuca to do the same thing. I find that really interesting. But I, I really think that this council, by making this, I'm not going to support this motion, is really putting itself into a corner where, A, you're going to have to defend your position, because I think it's against the Municipal Act, and with the Ombudsman's Office, because you are continually, with every report, intimating to the public that if you believe you have a valid complaint, and by the way, Mr. McDermott investigated that. He didn't, at the very... We have complaints that have come before us that have been deemed vexatious, uh, and I can't remember what the other word is, at the very beginning of the report, and he doesn't investigate. That's not what happened. He chose to do this investigation and then deemed it vexatious. So I, I really think you're running on a slippery slope here, and it, to me it appears to be intimidation and bullying tactics to people who are trying to hold their public um, counsel accountable. Okay. Yes, of course, Councillor Cario. Well, if you read the results of the report, you wouldn't say that, Councillor. In this particular case, the Integrity Commissioner goes out of his way to make his comments the way he makes them. I think everybody in the city who pays taxes should read this report and read the results. Thank you for that. See, We're going to go, Councillor, no, I'm going to go to the solicitor now, and I'm going to ask for his input uh, in terms of this request and I'd ask Mr. Lustig if you would please weigh in and let us know asking the uh, person who filed the report is there anything against the municipal act uh, that would prohibit us from asking them to contribute to the cost okay uh, do you see me and hear me I we hear you but I don't see you that's probably a good thing but here <laughs> I am okay now can you see me 
I don't see. Oh no! Does anyone see him? No. Is no. I. I oh, here. Wait a minute. Something's happening. There, there. you are. There you okay, are. Okay. So no, I, I don't think there's anything improper about making a request. It would certainly be improper if you tried to force the issue by demanding that they make the payment or something like that. But the motion, as I understand it, is making a request of the person to contribute. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Thank you for that. Can I, can I speak yep. to Councillor Ferrio's comment now? Yes. Um, it's very interesting. He talks about if you clearly read um, the report about Councillor Peter Angelo, those are the exact same comments I made when you made your motion, Mr. Mayor, for me to be investigated. And those exact same, same comments are in that report with Mr. DeLuca in regards to being able to speak about an elected official even if we're members of council. So nobody wanted to take the time to learn that, but now that's the stand or the hill that Councillor Kerry was standing on. So you can't have it both ways in the same meeting. All right, thank you, it's Councillor. Extreme, it's extremely hypocritical. Okay, well, I don't know, frivolous and vexatious this is the first time I've seen this, but uh, thank you for that. Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At our last meeting, when we had an integrity commissioner uh, report, it was the Spanton and Cario report, and we, we did talk about sending um, the applicant a bill. Our CAO suggested that that was not the way to go. So this is the wording in the last, in the um, minutes from last time. Um, that staff forward a letter to the complainant, complainant to inform of the cost of the integrity commissioner, commissioner's investigation and provide an opportunity to contribute any money towards the cost. We did have that discussion. Yeah. And I think that's the same thing that it, we just did. It, that, yeah. that's, I just want to make sure that it's not a bill that right. it's asking to contribute. Exactly. And we, we did, we did yeah. agree on it last time that it was okay and it was vetted through our CAO. Because exactly right. he did talk about the municipal act. Exactly right. Okay, so we've got a motion. Uh, by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Strange, is that right? Second yes. by Councillor Strange, yep. That we ask the person who filed the Integrity Commissioner complaint to make a contribution toward the cost. So we'll call that vote now. All those in favor? Okay, opposed? Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry, my, I was muted. I'd like a recorded vote, please. Okay, we'll have a recorded vote. We just, we did vote, but we can make it official on the uh, recorded section. Okay, so the mayor just read back the uh, the motion on the floor. Councillor Campbell? In favor. Councillor Dabrowski? In favor. Councillor Iannone? Opposed. Councillor Kirio? In favor. Councillor Lococo? In favor. Councillor Peter Angelo? Yes. Councillor Strange? In favor. Councillor Thompson? Yes. And Mayor Diodati? In favor. And that carries. Thank you for that. Okay, moving on to item 9.2, there's a resolution from the City of St. Catharines regarding a provincial nursing shortage. What's the will of Council? We, it's up to this Council. The recommendation is for the information of Council. Okay, uh, receive the report. Moved by Councilor Cario, second by Councilor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. Item 9.3, parking restriction concerns from residents of Chipman Crescent. Uh, there is a petition they're presenting. The recommendation is that we refer to staff. Motion from Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Thompson, that we refer the petition to staff. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Item 9.4, special occasion permit request for tequila expo taking place at the convention center. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, okay, opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous, thank you. Item 9.6, resolution from the town of Fort Erie regarding right of passage along the Lake Erie shoreline. Recommendation is that we receive. Councilor Lococo? I think you skipped number 9.5, Region. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'll go back. 9.5, Niagara Region Correspondence. Recommendation that we receive the information. Okay, motion by Councillor Lococo to receive, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you for that, Councillor Lococo. Uh, item 9.6, resolution from the town of Fort Erie 
They're passing a resolution that there should be a rite of passage along the Lake Erie shoreline. That's across private properties. Pardon me? Conflict. I didn't see that. I'll okay. declare conflict. I own a piece of property on the shoreline in Fort Erie. I okay. Declare conflict. Okay. Thank you for that. For yeah. Receive. Uh, moved by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Dabrowski that we receive for information. All those in favor? Okay. With Councilor uh, Cario declaring a conflict. That's uh, approved. Thank you. Item 9.7 Interdepartmental memo from the City Clerk regarding School Board Professional Development Day request. And the request is that. October 24th, next year, Municipal Election Day, that the school board have a, a professional development day. Is that right, Mr. Clerk? Okay, so we're looking, yes, moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously, thank you. Item 9.8, proclamation request, Islamic History Month, uh, October 1st through 31st to be Islamic History Month. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Item 9.9, .9, proclamation request respiratory therapy week, October 23rd through 29th. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Thompson, that we move the recommendation respiratory therapy week. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Item 9.10, proclamation flag raising request, International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Approved. November, hold on, hold on, you guys are too fast for me. November 25th, uh, Council, Councilor Coco uh, moved, second by Councilor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, approved thank you. Item 9.11, flag raising request, Meals on Wheels Week from October 3rd through October the 9th. Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Thank you. Item 9.12, uh, flag raising request, Positive Living Niagara HIV AIDS Awareness Week, November the 22nd. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Item 9.13, Hindu Forum Canada request for renaming of a street. Um, this recommendation refer to staff. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo. We refer to staff. Seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Item 9.14, request a waive requirement for commercial parking lot business license. Um, this is a... Okay. Motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, that uh, the request be extended to continue on the parking. Okay, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved unanimously. Thank you. Lundy's Lane BIA change to the board. BIA is requesting count. Okay. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange, that we support the change to the board. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Opposed. Oh, okay, with uh, opposition by Councillor Iannone. Moving on to resolutions, 10.1, uh, we have an interdepartmental memo from the city clerk regarding the school board professional development day for the election for next year, which we've already approved, looking for the resolution to be approved. Uh, Councillor, you have a conflict? Yeah, yeah Councillor Peter Angelo has a conflict. Looking for a motion by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Uh, in camera, Mr. Clerk. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. There were two items on the in camera meeting earlier this afternoon. Um, Firstly, that council accept offer an offer to purchase part 10 on reference plan 59R 16028 for the car or the price of $279,153 plus HST. And secondly, that council accept an offer to purchase parts one and three on reference plan 59R 16783 for $43,890 plus HST. Motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange. Oh, okay, right, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Dabrowski, all those in favor? Okay, thank you for that. And yes, Mr. Clerk? 
Uh, just based on the uh, deferral from earlier this evening, now might be a good time, if possible, to discuss uh, item 7.4, Municipal Works 2021-68, regarding the downtown BIA. I'm not sure if Councillor Campbell has a further update to that. I would move, move the recommendation, Your Worship. Conflict. Oh yeah, conflict by Councillor Coco. Okay, move. Okay, Councillor. Sorry, uh, motion by Councillor Campbell to move the two recommendations: the road closure across the downtown BIA Winter Market, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. Is there any discussion to that motion? Okay, they'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and opposed? Okay, with Councillor Iannone opposed and Councillor Lococo in conflict. Okay, great, thank you for that. The motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski to give the bylaws a first, second, and third reading. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Okay, and we are into new business. Councillor Lococo and then Dabrowski and then Strange. <laughs> Holy, hold on, let me get my notepad out here. Okay. Th thank yeah. you, Mr. Mayor. The diversity and inclusion in the anti-racism committee um, have talked about looking at um, expressing an interest for an indigenous, indigenous crosswalk. Mm -hmm. I know that Kathy Meldenhauer was looking into it, but I'd like to put a formal motion on the floor that staff bring us a report back with all of the, um, the costs, the possibilities, places in the city uh, that, that we look at that. I'd like to put that forward. Okay, thank you for that. And I know Councillor Thompson was also gonna make that same motion. So yeah, go ahead, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I, I would suggest that uh, in the motion you refer to the Falls View BIA Sue Mingle and uh, see if they would pick a, an appropriate crosswalk up in the Falls View, I think, which is uh, uh, appropriate for this whole issue. and. Uh, if they would share the cost with the municipality. So. Would you be willing to add that to your motion, Councillor? Yes. Councillor Coker. I, I wouldn't, I would, Sue Mingle in the, in that, the that part's fine. I just don't know about including half of the cost or share the cost, because I don't know what the cost is. I'm Maybe just we looking. we could just explore cost yes, share. Yes, yes, that would that? be yeah, fine. Okay. Yep, that would be fine. Okay, great. Yeah, oh yeah, that'll be part of it, yep. Okay, so we got a motion by Councillor Coco, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that we ask staff to come back with a report for a crosswalk with feathers uh, and explore the Falls View Business Improvement Area District and uh, have Sue Mingle uh, speak as well and look at cost sharing opportunities with the city. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you unanimously. Thank you for that, Councillor Coco. Uh, just one other thing. There's been quite a few residents that have been in touch with me about some accidents on Stanley Avenue and Lyons Creek Road. Uh, I have been in touch with our transportation department, but I just wanted to put it out there that to the residents that we are looking into it and staff is, is looking into some alternatives and uh, studies and reports and that sort of thing. Okay, yeah, it's good to know. I wonder why it's such a big intersection, why there'd be accidents. So I don't three know. sides to it. Yeah, I think a goose got killed. A goose got killed? A, a, a pet duck, I think. A pet duck. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Sometimes those rural roads that you do, you have their, their fowl crossing the roads, you gotta watch out for them. Okay, so um, was there, did we make a motion? What did we just do with that? I'm sorry. Was that a motion? I, I, or was that just direction or what was? Did sure, you I'll a put motion? a motion forward. I will put a motion okay, forward. Okay, motion by Councilor Coco that we have staff look at the intersection of Stanley and Lyons Creek Road. Uh, second by Councilor Strange. Uh, we'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you for that. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank okay, you. great, thank you. I got Councillor Dabrowski, and then Strange. Yeah, just quickly, and I'm not sure if you, Mr. Mayor, brought it up in your notes, Spooky Awards. Um, did you I touch I, on that? Kim, I know I did on CH this morning. Okay. I don't know if I did. No, no big ahead. deal. And if you didn't, if you did, great. If you didn't, even better. This <laughs> is a new update. Um, the Spooky Awards are back this year. For anyone who missed it last year, it's, uh, the Spooky Awards is basically a way for the whole city to celebrate Halloween. So we're encouraging homeowners from now until I think October 29th. All the details are at niagarafalls.ca slash spooky awards, but you can enter your home for free. Um, and then you can decorate your home in, in Halloween, theme, Halloween themed decorations. And as you mentioned on CH this morning, people celebrate Halloween now as much as they do Christmas. They're very passionate. Um, there's already homes with 
a huge displays, 50, 60 inflatables on the roof, um, some really intricate displays. Um, residents put a lot of time, a lot of resources, and a lot of money. Um, I know I had a blast last year touring around the city with the spooky map, seeing all the fun and creative um, decorations and, and seeing people get festive. I know at Thorold Stone and Dorchester Road, uh, Mr. Danny Petty, the homeowner there, he probably has over 200 displays, and if you miss it, you must have blinked. <laughs> um, because that's a, one of the, the main thoroughways into an outdoor city. And uh, his house, I mean, I don't even think he turns them off at night. I think they go <laughs> until 2, 3, 4 in the morning. Um, he really gets out there and celebrates. But either way, free for home, uh, homeowners to enter. Spooky Awards, um, sorry, NiagaraFalls.ca slash Spooky Awards um, to enter your home. And for those who don't want to enter their home, check out the Spooky Map. Very cool. It's free. Even though Halloween might, it'll, it'll probably feel a lot more normal this year than it did last year. I anticipate more people getting dressed up, more people handing out Halloween candy. This is basically a secondary way to celebrate Halloween across the municipality. So NiagaraFalls.ca slash spooky words. Councillor Strange um, <laughs> has a, a pretty cool idea he's come up with, so I think he's, he's going to explain it and put a motion on the floor. And before that, I do want to make a motion. Has the council in the past dressed up for Halloween? Have we? Uh, I know City Hall has in the past. I think we should. Uh, like at the next council meeting? But what's yeah. the date of the next meeting? Isn't it the 20th? October 25th? The 26th. Yeah, it, why not? I mean, it, I, think, I think one, it could go viral. Two, I can't wait to see all the costumes. I'm, uh, and, and I'm not sure if we want to do that. Maybe Councillor Strange can add that to I his motion. That, yeah. But it would be a way, I think, to promote the spooky wards and to just let residents across the city know that it is safe to go outside it is safe to trick-or-treat this year it is safe to hand out halloween candy there's obviously safety protocols that have to be in place but something to think about as we come out of this pandemic and i'll leave it to can Councilor i just ask Strange. before you finish are there prizes for the houses there is prizes so nine prizes in total there's different categories uh best lighting best uh, most creative people's choice so residents can actually go online after they've visited the spooky map and driven around the municipality to vote for their favorite and then homeowners can win i think it's a hundred dollar gift certificate a bnf um, swag bag and uh we run a consumer show kind of a, a business that i run framer in the falls and includes a mystery box for that as well so i think the prizes are valued at more than three hundred dollars per per homeowner who wins so it's free it's fun um I don't think a ton of people need more incentive to decorate for Halloween, but this is one. I'll just add to you, last year was a huge success. So many houses did it. It was awesome driving around, seeing some of them. People put a lot of creativity and they originality do. into it. Yeah. There was over 50, and I anticipate more of this year. I, people I, were emailing back in August. I was getting emails. Are you doing the spooky again? Is the city doing the spooky again? So they were just chopping at the bit to get uh, to get their Halloween direct decorations up. So. Okay, great. So uh, I, I wanted to kind of one-up it this year because I know what a success it was last year. And we're still kind of in that same kind of threshold where people are going to be worried about going out and stuff like that. And you're having people decorate your homes anyways. Well, why not add it and have people dress up? So I thought we could uh, have a, some prizes for, for some best costumes. And they can send the pictures in digitally. Um, you can take care of that. I'm sure Councillor Rossi was your tech savvy. Mr. Sean Oatley's uh, listening. There you go, with Sean's here. Right we now. can fix it up and have maybe five additional prizes for children's costumes, uh, an adult, adult best costume, couples costume. You know, me and Susie like the. Oh yeah. Yeah, we always. Uh, a, baby, a, baby's yeah. Hey, a baby, a baby's costume. Hey, a baby's costume. Who wants to dress your baby, and dress your pet's costume. Who wouldn't want that? Dress your goat. Is that because you have a pet now? That yes, exactly. That? Okay. I have to dress a goat parrot my dog <laughs> cat but i think it would be something and and uh if we can maybe add a thousand dollars to the budget to take care of some of those those prizes uh maybe we can do like a pet value uh, gift certificate for the the pet costume and 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 so forth but i think it would be awesome and even if you don't win let's post them all up i think it's a great way of of showing our community and, and the halloween spirit so i'd like to make that motion to add a thousand dollars to the current budget and have those extra five uh, prizes for uh, the different costumes okay motion by councillor yeah, strange and that everybody has to dress up for home <laughs> that we add a thousand dollars to the and Halloween. and is wayne coming as uh weekend at bernie's again or no he should he That's should so uh wayne will you be willing to be weekend at bernie's yes. okay good <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, I hope KJ got that one. Oh my God, that's awesome. 
Okay, motion by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Dabrowski, that we had a thousand dollars to the Spooky Award budget to include these costume dress up uh, categories, and that council are encouraged to dress up for the meeting on October the twenty. When is it? Twenty sixth. Mandatory. Mandatory. Okay, mandatory. And um, is that uh, is that that's it? Do I get it all? Yeah. Okay, and well, then we'll, we'll find a way of, of people sending their digital pictures in that we could right. broadcast these pictures, win or lose. Right. Yeah. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Yes, go ahead, Councillor Strange. Yeah, most in your pocket. Um, yeah, just the second one. I was golfing at Willowdale Golf Course the other day, and I had a, a few residents and the owner, they were talking about how Willowdale Street, when coming out on Lyons Creek, that the region is suggesting putting that into a, a one-way right. So as soon as you come out, you have to turn right no matter what because of the, the traffic that's gonna be coming up. And I think it's from the region that's coming because of the new hospital. And, and I think it's just, and they're really upset about it. Putting a laneway up there, yeah. which cuts the road. Which cuts the road. And, and I think there's some safety issues for, for fire, even an even ambulance. Like you, if you want to go to the hospital, you have to go right and then come back because the hospital's right on the left. <laughs> but anyways, there's some major concerns there, and uh, I, I know that there's, there's going to be heavy traffic, but I think a, a traffic light is, is better suited there than having a, a, as soon as you come out, having a one-way. There are some concerned residents, concerned golfers, and concerned people right on Willowdale. So if I'd like to bring back a, a, a report from, from traffic to hopefully, if we can, in, with, with the region, hopefully we can uh, put a traffic light there instead of that one way. Okay, so a motion from uh, Mike, seconded by Wayne, or uh, Councilor Strange, Councilor Thompson, that we ask our staff to come back with a report showing a traffic light at the intersection of Willowdale and Lyons Creek Road, and that we, uh, and, okay, yeah, just before I... Not put a laneway up Yeah. A, That's what I... A boulevard, a boulevard. A boulevard. Yeah. yeah, not have a, yeah, Wayne way. Okay. And not have a boulevard and uh, in con and have a consultation with the, uh, the region and the MTO. But now we'll go to Mr. Nickel, who's just waiting there eagerly to jump into the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to jump in uh, and let Council know that that design process is going through a, a full a Schedule C municipal class EA, and it's very close to being wrapped up. So um, I just want to be mindful that for staff to come back with a report. Um, we can come back with um, a status update on where that Class EA is at, um, but nothing has been finalized yet, although we're, we've you know, completed all of our three public consultation sessions. Um, I can give you a little bit of insight that the initial approach was to have uh, Willow Dell Road closed altogether. And uh, um, I've been fighting hard to keep that road open for traffic to turn in, both uh, left in and right in. And um, from a safety perspective, the best we can accomplish is a right out of that, uh, of Willowdale. Um, so I, I'd be happy to come back with a report, but I just want to make sure your expectations are tempered, that you'll likely just um, see a summary of where the municipal class EA is at right now. And um, um, they're, they're, the region's in the process of finalizing that. So if they have it submitted by the 26th, I can tell you that um, our next, Council meeting will just explain that it's been submitted. If it hasn't been submitted, I'll give you a status update of where we're at today. So um, maybe just a bit of direction on what you want us to come back with, because it is uh, an intersection of a regional road and the region would have jurisdiction there. Yeah, Councillor Strange. Yeah, through you to Mr. Nick. Do, do residents get notified of what's going on uh, with within, like especially the golf course and on Willowdale Road? Do they get notified what is happening and what is suggested? Strike one. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the uh, residents um, may not have been involved in the first public meeting, but were involved in the second public meeting and, it, and actually the golf course and some of the more vocal residents had an individual session with the region earlier on um, this uh, past spring. Um, so anything, any new meetings will include public consultation to the radius of area that people around Willowdell Road. Um, but uh, residents won't be specifically notified that that EA has been completed. Um, uh, that's something that they'd have to seek out for themselves. Council? So now, will the final decision come from 
city of Niagara Falls or it would be coming from the region? Yeah, Mr. Nickel? Yeah, thanks to you, Mr. Mayor. That is a regional decision. It's a regional led EA. Well, I just may like to make a motion. I'd rather see a, a, so you a can do traffic that. light there than a one way. Uh, according to all the residents that I've been talking to and the golf course, they would like that as well. So I'll, I'll move, make that motion. So you change your motion to uh, say that our position would be we'd rather to see a traffic light at exactly. the intersection of Willowdale and Lyons Creek. And not a boulevard. And not a, right, not a boulevard. Okay, so I got moved by Councilor Strange, second by Councilor Dabrowski. I've got Councilor Peter Angelo. Your Worship, I just have to declare a conflict. I mean, yeah. this is part of a larger road reconstruction, and my family owns property there. Yep. Motion by Councilor Peter, An or sorry, conflict by Councilor Peter Angelo. Uh, that's the motion that we've got right now on the floor. Uh, if we don't have any further discussion, we can call that vote. All those in favor? Okay. And that's unanimous that we ask uh, the region to consider s traffic lights there rather than a, an island. Okay, great. Do we have any other new business? Motion for adjournment. Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Thank you. We are done. Have a good night, everyone. Wait to see your costumes. <laughs>